You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the third part of What If Deku and Hero Academia Joins One Punch Man. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of Lumpe Spark 3 on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. So have you all made a decision? The boy with the green hair stood up and said yes. Great. The Hero Association thanks you all for your kind service. Before we go any further, however, I would like you all to follow me to the gymnasium. Before you all can become heroes, we need to analyze all of your capabilities so that we can accurately assign you to a hero class. The class moved and got up excitedly as they followed the agents to the gym. Staying slightly behind, Sitch spoke into his radio and asked for there to be an S-class summon later in the evening. Smirking to himself as he followed behind the teens, the first part of the plan went smoothly. However, convincing the S-class to take these kids on as essentially apprentices would prove difficult given their lone wolf nature even with his planning and spying on them. There was no guarantees they would still take the bait, and even if they do, would they really watch them or just sit them in some random corner somewhere? He sighed problems for a different time he guessed. He too was curious about just how capable these students and their quirks were. First however was the written test. This section held a lot more weight than people realized. He remarked that someone had broken every single fitness test record in the association's history, but completely flunked out on the written portion which probably relegated him to C-class if he had to guess. He made a note to send word down to the rankings team that in this case the written portion should only be weighted a quarter of how much it originally weighed. During recent times it seems now more than ever the association needed more heroes to counter monsters' rising appearances. So maybe loosening the weight entirely may be the best choice of action. What's a few stray heroes if they can get the job done maybe they wouldn't need to be heroes at all. There are a lot of strong individuals in all walks of life after all. By the time the written portion had concluded, Sitch had given the teens back their hero costumes from before. All of them cleaned and stitched back together to look brand new. The finesse test was next, however Sitch was less than impressed by most of the students. The first test being one 500 meter race proved a majority of the teens were practically average with some outliers, one being the obviously speed-powered quirk of the boy with engines in his legs and the boy that had attacked Blast so fast that he couldn't even see what happened. But there were others as well that surprised him with their ingenuity with their quirks the half-fire. An ice user used his ice as a slide and fire as propulsion, similarly to how the blonde-headed boy used his explosions to launch himself ahead. The top five finishes being Midoriya, Ida, Bakugo, Todoroki, and the bird faced Takoyami in that order. The second test being weightlifting. He wasn't surprised when many of the students were insufficient in this regard. A lot of them were not bodybuilders and their quirks weren't tailored for physical labor besides a few of them. Most maxed out at around 100 kilos. Certain individuals made it into the tons range and he was surprised of that a girl still remained among them although given her quirk it shouldn't have come with too much of a surprise. Being able to remove the gravity on an object essentially removes its weight as well. In the end the top five were Midoriya, Yuraraka, Shoji, Kirishima, Takoyami. Afterward there was the squat jumps and utilizing their quirks again most were fairly average in this test as well. Some notable ones being obvious at this point the first spot inevitably going to Midoriya, the explosive Bakugo second, the frog girl third, Ajiro fourth, and Sato coming in at fifth. Technically the gravity girl stayed and rose into the air indefinitely but they decided on her not using her quirk for this test in the sake of fairness. The next test was shot put. Nothing extraordinary happened that didn't happen with other strength based tests although after having some of the object be melted by a certain pink lady. The test was redone with a more reinforced put that could withstand the toxins, flames, and explosions the more unique students used to launch the put. The first one was inevitably Midoriya, followed closely by Bakuo, then Ida using his legs to launch the put in a spectacular display, followed by Asui, and fifth being Siro. The next challenge was an unconventional one. It was a whack-a-mole machine. The purpose of this test was to test hand-eye coordination and combat speed of an individual. The results were no surprise to him either, Midoriya as always came in first, followed by Shoji, 
Bakugo, Todoroki, and Ida. The last test he was unable to attend due to being notified of the S-Class showing up for the meeting. The punching bag test results were as he expected from the students those who did not have physical enhancements with their quirks were fling on the average level with their punches, stronger than he expected of the average teen but still average overall for a hero. The teens that came out on top in this event was Midoriya, Ida although it was a kick not a punch, Kirishima, Takoyami, and fifth being Ajiro using his tail. He left the teens for the other tests and walked towards the S-Class meeting. He hoped everything would go well here as well. As he entered the room, he immediately saw the occupants were all familiar to the last time barring Puri Puri prisoner which was already the sign of a blessing as that would save him the time of explaining why he was excluded from the conversation. He greeted the S-Class and the single B-Class that joined the meeting and began before anyone got antsy about why they were summoned on such short notice. The reason I've gathered you all today was not some appending doom that would doom the world like before. So you're just wasting our time then. Tatsumaki exclaimed, Well, no something else has come up. Some teens have appeared recently that have manifested some supernatural abilities. We have collected these teens to train them in how to use their powers and to become heroes but they lack experience so we were hoping that you all would take them under your wing and supervise them. As he said this the table they all sat around began to light up, each showcasing the teens in question and brief descriptions of their powers and abilities. What? You think I'm going to watch over some stupid weak kid? Just because they have some fancy powers? Tastumaki exclaimed once more. I'm with the little lady on this one. I don't have time to watch over weaklings. Atomic Samurai said. Bang flashed a big smile and said I would gladly take them all under my wing. It would be my pleasure to take on the burden so my fellow S-Class can roam around free. Sitch waved a hand as he denied Bang's offer no. No, Bang we couldn't ask that of you besides. Of the unique powers they were given only a very few of them actually have any physical hand-to-hand -hand ability. It would be better to have them under a hero that can fully maximize their potential. On the table we have divided the teens into heroes who we would like them to work under. Have no fear of undertaking such a task we will offer you all bonuses that you can't refuse. Bang's smile fell and he along with the rest of the heroes turned to look at the screen below them. Tatsumaki had an extra note on her screen from Blast. It was a picture of him with his thumbs up and a smile on his face. She remembered meeting him the other day and him telling her that something like this would happen and he wanted her to go along with it. She breathed a deep sigh before resigning herself to actually looking over teens in question immediately closing windows that had the gender as male. She was left with five choices left each of them with a rather uninteresting power. The one that was highlighted for her was a brown-haired girl that had the ability to float objects. Assuming she was another Esper user she agreed to take her on just for Blast's sake. But after this he would owe her now. Fine, I'll accept her, but don't come crying to me if she doesn't want to be a hero to be a hero anymore or she ends up kicking the bucket. Tatsumaki said, hearing her of all people say that shocked the rest of the S-Class, they thought she would be the last one to agree with the situation. But their shock continued further when the Drive Knight also voiced his approval of the deal. I too can agree to such terms, however given the heroes in the room and the number of teens presented I assume you expect some of us to take more than one of them. In that case I would like to take the electric user along with the creation girl. In doing so are you giving me free will over them and their bodies? The way the knight phrased that question made Sitch uncomfortable, and responded as long as they consent to whatever you plan for them then yes. What do you plan to do with them? I only plan to study them. You said these powers manifested in them and given that you didn't name a reason, I would like to find out for myself and if these powers could be replicated in others as well. The driver knight said flatly in reply. The mood suddenly lifted again as the other heroes sat and studied the screens in front of them. Bang rose his head immediately after trying to take the initiative that drive the knight left. Well if we can take two of them, I would also like to express that chance. The young boy that you marked for me named Ajiro, I would gladly take him on along with the boy named Midoriya as well. Sitch nodded and accepted Bang's deal. Pig God was the next in line to speak up. I would like this one Ugsato I would also like more sweets to be brought to my room for the next few days free of charge. He said pointing to a picture of a big-lipped guy with brown hair at first Sitch racked his brain with intrigue on why he chose that particular student but realized that on the document it said that he liked to bake desert, and his quirk revolved around sugar meaning pig god could comfortably request sweets all for the sake of helping his student in his training. Shaking his head Sitch reluctantly agreed to the pig god's deal, as long as it's one less kid off the table. Just try not to go overboard. 
Sitch calmly says. Super Alloy Darkshine looked over the remaining teams and was interested in the one highlighted for him. He had red hair and his hardening ability. Curious to see just how durable that made him and he would be glad to instruct someone so young in building muscle to support such an ability. I'll accept the Kirishima boy. Sitch agreed and looked to the rest of the S-Class heroes looking over first to the demon cyborg he asked for his thoughts. No, me and my master don't need any more mouths to feed. And I have no interest in taking care of children. He said finally. Sitch internally sighed to himself but this was expected as was his master's appearance in this room which was a blessing. Hopefully what he was about to say will not escalate things too much. You won't have to feed them and I am not asking them to stay with you. They will still be housed here and be sent out to you or a designation of your choosing. I still refuse, Gino said in reply. Even if I offer you and your master a money bonus of 2 million yen. Gino's was about to again but his master immediately stopped him after some large amount of murmuring. Gino's turned back and said fine, I'll accept this one he said pointing to a blonde-headed teen with explosive hair. Sitch continued however, you know, your master shares a shocking resemblance to a hero who we received constant complaints from civilians for the incident with a demon level threat not too long ago. A number of them wanted this hero expelled from our rankings and some were major influencers of ours as well. Gino squinted his eyes are you making a threat? No, but I can inform the public that the problem individual has been reprimanded and wipe away the complaints he receive. Even promote him to be class rank 33 if you are inclined to take another teen under your wing, with future positions possible. After more murmurs from the duo, Gino's turned and accepted the offer Sitch gave him. He looked down and looked over the remaining teens and chose the teen with the red and white hair. You're sure going all out with trying to get us to watch these kids, is there something we should know? Child Emperor asked. Sitch waved his hands nothing's it just that we hope to cultivate these heroes and fine tune them into something better. Sitch looked over to the king. I hope you can see the use of raising the next generation king. And would agree to do this for the association. The king simply nodded his head as his mind was filled over with thoughts on what he should do. He didn't know if he should pick someone that is strong or someone weak. If he chose someone strong then they could fight battles in his place and pass off his passiveness as tough training but if they fail he wouldn't be able to save them and he would be revealed as a weakling and a coward on the other hand. If he chose a weak student then he could run away from the danger and excuse it as getting them out of a bad situation, but then if they were corned and forced to fight the student wouldn't be much use in a fight. Hum he racked his brain and simply went with his gut and pressed his hands on the table in front of him without looking. I choose this one, he said finally. Sitch was partially surprised on who King had chosen but hearing the faint roar of the King's engine he decided not to press him on the subject and simply agreed to his choice figuring he may have seen something in the purple-haired kid that he did not. He turned his head towards Metal Bat who looked incredibly uninterested in any of the conversations going on being on his phone even looking at something he couldn't see. Metal Bat, given your handful of next jobs for the association, I'll assign you this student to make them easier. He can talk to animals so it will make any future incidents with influencers' pets escaping easier. The metal bat looked up and smiled slightly at that but said if he's an annoying bastard, don't blame me if I pummel him into the ground. Sitch made a mental note to tell the teen that metal bat always did have a short temper, which was another reason he paired those two together specifically hoping that the reservedness of the kid and hothead that was bad would balance each other out. He looked around the room again and this time turned his attention to Tank Top Master who was skimming through the remaining applicants. He seemed to take an interest in one individual and raised his head to meet his eyes. This kid here says his hero costume is a tank top. Guess he's a fan of the tank toppers. Would be criminal if I didn't give him a shot of joining in. Sitch nodded and switched his eye towards Flashy Flash. He seemed just annoyed from this whole debacle and didn't even look at the screen. Flash I would suggest looking at the screen in front of you. We will also supply you with the latest and greatest of hair products if you take one of the teens under wing. That last statement got the hero's attention he tried to feign ignorance but he looked down at the screen and once he did he stopped all pretense of pretending to not care. The screen below showed information of a stranger attempting to break into the hero's HQ and being captured. The only information they were able to get out of the man was that he was there for Flash and would not talk with anyone but him. This got Flash's attention. No doubt this man was an assassin sent to kill him but from whom remained to be known. Sure, but if he ends up dead don't blame me. I don't guard weaklings and as you can see people are after me so sticking with me will put a target on his back as well. Sitch nodded slowly, pondering if he should really allow a teen to be around someone like Flash. It should be okay, the one he picked for him seemed to have a good chip on his shoulder and book smart. He should be fine. He looked over next to Zombie Man who stared back at the man. 
I'm curious, what are you going to offer me? I don't practically need anything important. Well true but we believe we have a tip for you if you comply about a specific doctor that you may be interested in. And the teens we have in mind would greatly aid you in your search and expertise. We know you specialize in espionage, spy operations and reconnaissance so we assigned two of the teens that would best accommodate that. Sitch replied. Zombie was somewhat surprised at the hint of the doctor they were referring to, easily blocking out all of the rest of Sitch's speech regardless. He looked down at the screen and saw that one teen had a form of invisibility, and the other grew stronger in a darker environment. They could be useful indeed. He chuckled and said, All right, you got yourself a deal. Zombie man said. Sitch then turned his eyes towards the atomic samurai who had his hands crossed behind his back and head up and his eyes closed. He must have sensed Sitch stare because he spoke to him. No deal old man, I don't care what you say there, nothing you can say that could change my mind. I even glimpsed a lot of them, none of them even know how to use a sword, their time would be worthless with me anyways. While he had a point, the teen he had in mind, was unconventional and the complete opposite of each other capabilities wise but that was the more reason he wanted them together. The boy could learn to overcome his weakness by practicing under probably one of the greatest swordsmen in the world. Thinking of swordsmen however, are you sure? If you looked at the screen you would have been shown the image of an island. That island is peculiar in that it only rises during the summer when the sun is highest in the sky. It rises from the sea and sinks down some time later. The readings we have on the island is that an energy from within the island is causing its rise and fall. Scans show that it's metallic in nature, and in the shape of a blade. With that atomic samurai shot up and out of his chair. Hey, hey are you really suggesting what I think you are? Cause that's not something to joke about. He had a serious expression on his face. I'm not saying that it's confirmed to be there but it is a peculiar situation we can get you and anyone you wish to accompany you to the island. If you take the teen of course, Sitch said. Atomic Samurai started to walk away but agreed to the deal and left the meeting to prepare for the trip and talk to the council. Mentally letting out a relieved breath, all of the hard-headed people were taken care of which only left Child Emperor who was sitting there sucking on his lollipop as he watched the events play out. Let me guess you want me to take the remaining three huh? Child Emperor said. No, actually just the two remaining females we have some plans for the lone male in the group. It would save us some hardships later on if we fill him in on what's going on and ease the public into some of the teens' appearances if they are revealed. This got the remaining members' attention. Are you suggesting that these powers they manifested also altered their outward appearance? The child emperor asked. Well, not exactly all of them. Some of them can pass off being normal but others have strange changes to their body. We assume that their bodies naturally developed this way to better accustom themselves to their powers. As Sitch was talking the table below them was creating a large holographic image of one of the kids. He seemed normal enough other than his head which was replaced by a bird's. There was a second boy next to him that seemed normal other than the fact that he had several arms that are webbed together. The third image was strangely just floating boots and gloves. These are the most abnormal of the bunch and the third holographic is not a glitch. That girl really is invisible. She apparently has no ability to control it and seems to be in a natural state. And I thought I was going to be the weirdest one in the association forever, let me guess those two are mine. Zombie man pointed to the bird-faced teen and the invisible girl. Sitch nodded in confirmation. Yes, you would be correct. Given your talents we thought that it would give the least amount of potential exposure to the public. The last one here was selected by you tank top master. He as you can see he has multiple arms but that's not all, he has the ability to spawn even more from his body. And not just arms either, he can spawn things such as eyes, mouths, ears, and maybe more. That would be pretty hard to explain to people that see them in action. What do you suggest we do about that? The tank top master asked. We plan on issuing them specialized suits that will allow them to use their abilities, without hindering them but be played off more as cybernetics than natural talents. With that I have nothing else to report. If you have any further questions feel free to ask them now, if not. We expect you to meet them here tomorrow evening. We will have additional information of their abilities prepared along with their artificial ranking and class to give you a gauge on their talents. None of the S class had anything else to say and began filling out of the room, off to who knows where. Sitch form visibility relaxed as he sat down in his chair with a thud. Now that everything was complete, time to check on how the teens were doing. 
He wagered that by this time they should be doing their selected training based on their individual powers and abilities. He brought up a screen with the data from the fitness test and the results was what he expected a good majority of them were put into low C class, but since some of the kids didn't rely on their physical ability to fight it was the best option to give them tests based on the power of the quirks themselves which could boost some higher than what these results would indicate. The class was wiped out from the day's activities. The mental challenge of the opening written exam combined with the physical test reminded them of a harder version of the quirk appreciation test they did at the beginning of school. Then the real challenge came when they took everyone aside individually to test out their quirks specifically. It shocked them how they had managed to design tests to accommodate them so quickly. Midoriya had to go through rigorous weightlifting within a gravity chamber to accurately gauge his strength. His black whip was tested for its accuracy and yield strength. Smoke screen was tested by endurance and thickness. Fujin was tested to gauge the increase in strength or speed, while danger sense was tested by a number of factors such as debilitation, surprise, and hidden attacks. That Hugo was tested for explosive damage and how many tons of TNT his explosions are worth. Todoroki was tested for temperature of his flames and ice, the distance he can fire them, and how long he can shoot them out and many more examples from the rest of the class. Some expressed concern especially Ida when Kirishima explained his tests, which were him essentially being shot at and blown up by weapons. But Kirishima expressed that he was fine if not just a little singed. On a lighter note the class got a good laugh out of what they did to Kaminari. They had him hooked up to a generator to test how much energy he can absorb and discharge at a time. Momo was the most tired out of everyone and could barely explain what they had her do before going to bed. They had her create multiple large objects at a rapid pace to find out the amount of mass energy ratio needed for her quirk to function. Koda was taken outside of the facility to see how far his invoice went, and apparently he was also taken deeper into the facility and faced against he described as mutated animals. He could understand them enough but if he attempted to exert control over them the only thing that would happen is that they would shake their head as if in pain and become rabid and try to attack him through the glass. It caused some discussion of why the association had them inside the facility if they were so dangerous and not in some pound. Soon the conversation steered from the test to the results. Ciro made a point that since this world didn't have quirks they would essentially be superheroes in their eyes and because of that they would probably put in a high class and Bakugo added that he would definitely be S class stating that other would probably be B class heroes just like how they would be in their world. But that was for tomorrow's events apparently. Sitch had come to tell them of the news and the situations they would be in to operate as heroes. They would essentially be work study students again under an official hero. They would also have their ranks delivered to them in the morning in the rec room. The rest of the day was spent just consulting with one another about everything transpiring before everyone called it a day and went to sleep. Morning came quickly and the teens quickly gathered into the rec room eager to get their score and class rating. The room grew quiet as Sitch was accompanied by another member of the association. This one had wore a similar attire to Sitch, but he had a more angular face with a stubble beard. They approached the forward center of the room and the worker started speaking. First and foremost I would like to thank you all for agreeing to join the Hero Association. Given Yul's unique situations, we have made customary accounts for all of you and have deposited an initial sum of money that should help you all buy some clothes of your own and any other materials that you desire. He braked in his speech as the students whooped and cheered, especially the one in pink. Any hero duties you accomplish will be rewarded monetarily and deposited into these accounts, and these will be the cards you can use to access that money at any given time if the store has the capability. They each have your name on them and will be passed out along with your new hero card that displays your hero class and rank within that class. We are also going to hand out the data plan for your cellular devices. The money will be coming from the associations as you work as a hero. The beard worker stepped back and Sitch took his place holding an envelope in his hands. Ayama, C-Class Rank 120, Ashido, C-Class Rank 105, Asui, C-Class Rank 92, Bakugo, a class rank 20, Hagakure, C class rank 380, Ida, B class rank 72, Gyro, C class rank 100, Kaminari, C class rank 124, Kirishima, B class rank 70, Koda, C class rank 200, Midoriya, S class rank 14, Minta, C class rank 250, Ajiro, C class rank 90, Sato, C class rank 110, Shoji, C class rank 91, Todoroki, 
S class rank 17, Siro. C class rank 125, Takoyami. A class rank 31, Yuraraka. C class rank 130, Yeyurazu. C class rank 114. As Momo took the cards, Sitch began to speak again. For some of you may have noticed that your hero names have been changed. We have brought them more in line with our standards and regulations. We also would like to ask those with excessive mutant traits to stay seated while the others report to the gym to be picked up by your professional hero for the day. As the students filed out of the rec room towards the gym, more agents began to come into the rec room with the mutant teens, taking measurements and asking probing questions about their extra body parts and how fabric reacts to it and how much can be covered up before losing functionality. After around 10 minutes the questions and measurements were done and they went along to join their friends in waiting for the heroes in the gymnasium. The class was in the midst of constant discussion about everything that had just transpired their class, ranks, and some of their new hero names. What happened Bekugo? I thought you were going to be in class S. Siro said teasingly. Yeah, yeah guess you aren't as strong as you think you are. Kaminari piled on. You should have heard him when they said Midoriya and Todoroki were announced. I swear the fact that he didn't burst out there was nothing short of a miracle. He's really come a long way. Kirishima mentioned. Shut up, you idiots. Aren't you guys mostly C-class anyways? Pathetic. For me since my ranking is an S that just means they're just as incompetent as the rest of you. They can shove this rank up their ass because that's where it's best. That Hugo lashed out as he looked back towards his card. The group was momentarily drawn to silence thinking that did Beck Hugo just rhyme on purpose. Well he hasn't improved that much apparently, Ashido said. Shut your mouth pinky your C-class like the rest of them too. Beck Hugo replied. Ah, 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 that's not my hero name anymore, now it's Acidic Cherry. Not the most tasteful name but it's okay, for the most part. She said with a smile. Another group of students were talking as well. What? My new hero name is Green Menace. That makes me sound more like a villain than a hero. Midori pointed out to his group. Ida nodded his head in understanding yes it seems this hero association has no comms with putting more intimidating words in their hero's names to perhaps put fear into the people that may cause trouble. It could also be because you're a part of the S-Class now so they wanted you to have an intimidating sounding name. They may not understand what your original name meant. That's a shame I really like that name too but Ida has a point. Deku wouldn't really inspire fear amongst villains and according to him that's all they care about. Yuraraka said, I had no doubts you would have made S-Class Midoriya. You do have All Might's quirk after all, Ribbit. Asui said, Yeah, I'm surprised that so many of you were put in C the lowest class. The heroes here must be really strong as well but they don't have quirks. How could that be right? Maybe they evolve differently from us so that they can survive in their environment. But why would they evolve similarly to humans? Midoriya began to mutter aloud again as his friends looked on with smiles on their faces, happy that remains of the old Midoriya still exist in him. There were two students separated from the others consulting one another. You seem somewhat down more than usual. Ajiro said, What? Me? I'm not down, I'm fine. How could you tell even if I was anyways? Hagakure replied, because I know you, you're always so cheery and waving your sleeves around to signal your emotions. When they called your class and rank your shoulders and posture notably slumped down and you haven't said much since. I can only guess you being so low in comparison to everyone else has put you down. Ajiro said. Toru's heart began speeding up as he spoke about her. It would have been even faster if he could see her face which was blushing from the attention he gave her. Suddenly the memory of the visions she saw flashed through her mind and her demeanor dropped once more. I'm fine. It's just more confirmation of how weak I am. It's lucky that I even got into UA. Ajiro put a hand on her shoulder and said, You're not weak, you're just unique. I thought I was weak as well compared to everyone else so to prove them and myself wrong. I trained hard to surpass their expectations. You got into UA with your own merit and you can always keep progressing. She smiled at the boy for his kind words and replied I guess you're right. Maybe I could catch up to you one day. Look at you even for having such an ordinary quirk you're the seventh highest in the class. You definitely proved everyone that doubted you wrong. Ajiro was slightly flustered and said yeah. It surprised me as well. Shoji was only one rank below me. As for the others above it didn't surprise me in the least but I'll still keep trying to get better I may never catch up to them but that doesn't mean we should just give up and not try to. Hagakure proceeded to walk over and give Ajiro a quick hug which made the young boy blush before saying thank you. For saying that I really needed it. She turned to walk towards one of the larger groups in the class before turning around and saying, I guess I have to watch myself more carefully since your eyes are so focused on my body. Seeing the boy blush she laughed and turned away before the boy could recover from the statement and defend himself. 
both walking past another group of students discussing name changes. My hero name was changed from Creati to the Creationist. Seems just as an added extension of the original I don't see why the need to change it. Momo said, My hero name was changed to Frozen Phoenix. It makes sense given my powers. Shoto said, They thankfully decided to keep my name Earphone Jack, given my power as well. What about you? Gyro said, surprised by her pointing to him, Koda quietly replied. They, they decided to change my hero name as well. It's now Forest King. Hum, that seems like a cool name actually, Shoji said behind them. I agree it suits you and your power as well, Takoyami said. Koda just nodded while shying away from the conversation, not used to having all attention being on him. While the group continued to speak, just what I expect from you Todoroki you were placed in S class. I'm surprised that a lot of us were put into the C class. Are the heroes just that strong here? Given the test we did I'm sure I would have done better than most. Momo said. It's likely that this association thinks highly of physical ability. And those with more range capabilities were penalized from their physical performance. Todoroki explained. I agree with Todoroki. If I hadn't developed Dark Shadow's Dark Abyss to cloud my body it's unlikely that I would have been in the A-class. Takoyami added. What does the classes mean anyways? Why are they so important? Shoji asked. They created a class system to better deploy heroes to certain threats. C-class heroes are to handle threats of wolf and below, B-class are for tiger threats, a class for tiger threats, and S-class for demon and dragon threats. This means that it is unlikely for us to be sent out against horribly dangerous opponents. Momo explained. The group discussed more about this threat level system in comparison to the class system. Another group was getting restless about meeting these other world heroes. Hey Minta, if we are to follow the standard Sky procedures it is highly likely that the professional hero we train under is probably gonna be some good looking babe. Kaminari whispered. This got the boys attention and anticipation going. For real, having to spend time with a smoking babe, fighting and training against each other and going out the boy started to get louder, and louder as his fantasy started to overtake his thoughts but was quickly interrupted. Shut up, they would probably stick us with some A-class nobody. Bakugo stated harshly. As he said those words the gymnasium door opened up and Minta and Kaminari were both desperately trying to see if they could see a girl about to walk through the door only to be confronted with a giant wall of muscle squeezing his way through the door. He was a incredibly tanned and oiled behemoth of a man. That wore only a speedo which garnered some flustered glances from the girls of the class and all from Kirishima from how built that manly man was. The next to step in was someone that was the complete opposite of the first to enter. An older gentleman with his arms behind his back and grey hair and a black top and grey pants. He was muscular as well but nowhere near as much as the man he stood next to. The next man to enter also struggled to get through the gym doors while the first was due to his sheer size and musculature this one was solely due to his weight and round belly he had a fancy hair, and multiple chins. But the greatest thing to stick out to them was his size he was a very fat person and in his hands he held up what appeared to be cookies he was eating out of the bag. He took his place next to the older gentleman offering him a cookie to which he refused. The next person in was also a surprise. He looked like just a child with a backpack on and brown hair which held a device in his hands that he was constantly tapping away at, not even bothering to look at the teens as he walked in and quickly went by the fat man. The next man to enter the gym didn't seem like a man but more a machine. He had a singular red eye and an intimidating appearance with his body being fully exposed shrouded in a black metallic armor. His eye visibly scanned over all of the teens before he went over and stood next to the child. The next one to enter was what appeared to be a teen like them but his armor seemed to be completely encased in metal with blonde hair and black eyes similar to Mina. However, instead of walking towards the rest of the group, he walked towards the center between the students and the heroes and called out two names. Back you go. Todoroki come forward now. Hey, demon cyborg, you're supposed to wait for Sitch to give the okay before leaving. The child emperor said patronizingly, My master has an important mission for today and I will not dawdle around longer than I have to. Child Emperor just let out a sigh before turning his attention back to his device. As Genos turned back around the two teens were in front of him as requested. He pointed to the door and ordered them to follow him out and began to leave. They were hesitant to leave at first but in the doorway they saw Sitch nod his head at them that it was okay and they quickly followed Demon Cyborg out of the gymnasium. After the whole incident more people had filed into the room across from the rest of the teens. There were three people huddled close together with various blades and one was missing an arm. Another was a definitely pale man with red eyes in a trench coat. Another man with long blonde hair. And another muscular man with short blonde hair in a tank top. 
The last one to enter the room other than Sitch was a small girl who like the blonde teen before her didn't stand with the rest of her peers, but walked well, more like floating to the center of the room and calling out a name. Yuraraka, raise your hand we're leaving. If Demon Cyborg doesn't have to sit through the rest of this then I'm not. The girl's voice seemed annoyed and it was clear that her temper was similar to Bakugo's. Yuraraka hesitantly raised her hand and then found herself surrounded by a green aura, and to her surprise, hurled through the air towards the girl in the center, who was already turning away and leaving the gymnasium with her in tow. Sitch sighed to himself but expected nothing less from the two individuals in question. The S-Class was always an unruly bunch of people. He ran his hands through his hair and began to speak. I thank you all for being here today. These are the students I had told you all of yesterday, and to the teens these will be your new teachers for the time being. These are S-Class heroes, the best of the best the hero associations have to offer, well most of them anyways. He said looking over at Atomic Samurai's pupils here in his place. We tried to pair the best teacher for your ability to help you all grow from their tutelage. Without further preparations, I'll introduce them and the students who will be training under them. After that you will be free to leave and explore with your teacher. We will offer you all transportation to and from your teacher's city if they are located away from a city. The first hero would be Super Alloy Darkshine. Please step forward, your student will be Kirishima. Both the teacher and the student walked forward and greeted each other. Wow, you are the epitome of manly, makes sense why they would have me under you. I can't wait to get started. The youth's excitable nature was infectious as Darkshine smiled and replied. That's a great spirit to have, but I'm slightly disappointed by your lack of muscles. Does your quirk really help that much in your defense? Yeah, my hardening ability was second to none in my school. It makes my body stronger than steel. And if I'm really serious I can take it even further. While I look forward to seeing that, there is a gym I like to go to here in the association. Let's go there first and test you out. With that both of them left out and began walking out of the gym towards their destination. Sitch began again. The next hero, Silver Fang, and your students, Ajiro and Midoriya. The two teens and hero met in the center of the gym and greeted each other Midoriya with a formal handshake but Ajiro performed a bow which caught the hero's attention. Oh, so have you heard of my dojo, young one? He returned the jester in kind. No, but I can tell by the way you dress that you are at least somewhat familiar with martial arts, which would explain why they chose you to teach me. Oh wow cool, what style are you a practitioner of? Midoriya asked with his growing curiosity. I am the creator of the water stream rock smashing fist. The old man said happily. The name didn't ring any bells in his head so Midoriya looked to Ajiro for any insight on the fighting style, but he shook his head as well. The look of confusion on the boy's face was a somewhat grim reminder of how his dojo lost its blister in the present day but he smiled nonetheless. What fighting style do you two practice? Given your gi I assume you have been formally trained in some arts. The boy with the tail nodded. Yes, I trained to be a black belt in karate, taekwondo, and judo, with some knowledge in tai shing. The boy with the tail said. Hum, interesting. I have never heard of those arts before. I would be glad for us to share points and forms in the coming days. And you young boy, he said, turning his head to Midoriya. Oh, um, me well, I just punch and kick things. I usually mimic others I have seen as reference mostly. He said, rubbing the back of his head bashfully. I see, well that will make you an excellent student then. I shall show you to my dojo. I assume there is transport waiting outside. Bang asked looking at Sitch. Sitch nodded his head and radioed ahead that Bang was coming towards them with that Midoriya, and Ajiro both said goodbye to everyone before making their way out. His system of calling the hero and students in question continued on. Ida was next his hero was the long-haired blonde. He tried to offer a greeting but the blonde said nothing and slowly moved around the boy. His eyes analyzing his form and once completing a full rotation around the boy he simply said to follow him out of the gym which Ida did after flashing a wary glance back to his fellow classmates. The next pair was Mina and Gyro, their hero was the hero child emperor. They were shocked to learn that he indeed was a child and were curious how this boy was among the S class, but he assured them that he makes do with his intellect and technology in fact he said that he would like them to come with him to his lab to test some inventions of his that should supplement their quirks nicely. After hearing that Mina was ecstatic and Gyro was optimistic of the child's offer, they left the gym shortly after. The next hero was not singular but a group. Atomic Samurai Disciples, would you please advance forward? The hero under the Atomic Samurai's watch will be Siro. The group of three stepped up to the center of the gym. Siro was a bit intimidated by all three of them, and the weapons they were wielding and decided to break the ice with a joke. It looks like I'm a fellow disciple now as well. I hope you don't mind me sticking around. 
Nothing came from the trio but weird looks and Ciro tried to explain while holding his left arm out to shake the blonde man in the lead hand. Get it? Because my quirk uses tape haha. <laughs> The group was a bit taken back by his statement but the leader shook his hand nonetheless. My name is Iyan, this is Bushidril, and this Akame Tachi, we are all in the top four of the A class and are here representing our master atomic samurai. He was too busy with the council of swordsmen to come here so he sent us to retrieve you. Did you say that your ability revolves around tape? Bushidril questioned, to which Ciro nodded, causing them besides Iyan to facepalm while Iyan turned to face switch. Is this some joke? I thought you said you assigned the students based on the similarity to the hero in question. Sitch waved his hands in mock surrender. We attempted to yes, but none of them are compatible with the sword. Assigning someone with the exact opposite ability could also produce further growth as well. Sitch reasoned. Indian nodded and somewhat found reason with his logic. It's unlikely that Atomic Samurai cared for the student but the information he was given to call upon the Council of Swordsmen so quickly. Akame Tachi, the only girl of the group, spoke next. What's your class and rank kid? Siro began to look down and shyly said it's C-class rank 125. Even Iyan couldn't leave out the sense of disappointment in his voice as all three members sighed heavily just don't slow us down. Once he said that and as the three began to walk away gesturing for Siro to follow, he turned around to say goodbye and flip off Kaminari and Minta who were snickering and laughing at him. After that situation resolved itself roll call continued next was the metal man or robot that was called Drive Knight he was to look after Yeyurazu and Kaminari despite his intimidating appearance and voice he tried to sound friendly and simply left with the two students in tow. Sato was next and his teacher just looked too big to be someone strong and his name matched his size, Pig God. He was friendly but he must have an appetite as the first place he said they were going was to the kitchen. The next student was Koda and his teacher didn't even look more than a year older than him but they seemingly left the gym in a hurry due to the hero's sister needing to be picked up from school. The next up was Toru and Takoyami whose hero was the tall pale man in a trench coat. Despite how he looked he seemed like a normal person and he offered to take them out somewhere to eat first before they start their hero work. There was only one hero remaining and the last few thought they all were going to train under him but as Sitch spoke they were surprised. Last but not least, Tank Top Master and Shoji, please step forward. This triggered an outburst from Maita. What? That's it? What about us? He's right, Ribbit. Were we not picked by anyone? Asui said. That can't be right. No one could overlook my shining sparkling brilliance. Ayama said while sparkling and spinning with his cape. Sitch turned to address them. Settle down now, your heroes are either indisposed at the moment or as in the case of one of you have a special situation to consider. Meanwhile in the center of the gym tank top master and Shoji were sizing each other up. The man stood a whole foot taller than the teen with a similar comparison in bulkiness although what had caught the large hero attention mostly was the teen's multitude of webbed appendages that seemed like little nubs. Taking notice of what the large hero was staring at he decided to open up about it. I know someone like me would be seen as out of ordinary here. I hope it won't cause a problem in our cooperation. He finished holding out a hand for the large hero to shake. He looked at his hand curiously as the appendages seemingly sprouted out to little nubs. He ultimately shook the boy's hand and said as long as you treasure the tank top like the rest of the toppers, it shouldn't be a problem. I'll clear it up with the guys once we get back there. Shoji was a bit confused by his statement but was happy that his mutant quirk wouldn't get him in trouble with the hero in question and from what he said he too had some apprentices that he would meet as well. We should get a move on. While the tank toppers you won't have to worry about I can't say the same for the public in general. But as long as you're with me you shouldn't have to have too much to worry about. Thank you. I'll try to learn as much as I can under your care. With that both the student and teacher exited the gym leaving only three students remaining with somewhat disappointed looks on their faces. As for the rest of you, if you would all come over here, you will be given a driver to take you all to the destination that your hero set out for you to arrive. The teens all steadily huddled around the switch and the agent from before gilded into the area. To make a long story short, due to circumstances your mentors couldn't make it today. You look to Asui your mentor is a S-class hero called Watchdog Man he is the sole protector of Q-City. As for you he said pointing towards Ayama your hero is a class rank 1. Handsomely sweet mask, he was busy with a scheduled meeting in place, while he may be in the A class but he's the undoubtedly the most popular hero and deals with most show business. As he spoke Ayama beamed with joy and sparkles. And finally you he said turning to Maita, your hero is the legendary and possible strongest hero in the association the S class hero king. He messaged us that he had an important issue that he nearly forgot about. So he said for you to meet him at his apartment. Maita was conflicted about the news. 
He really wanted his hero to be a hot babe, but on the other hand the hero he was going to be training under was a super mega strong guy this world's all might essentially and he was excited to meet him. The group happily went off with the bearded worker into their car. The first stop for the group was Ayama. He was handed a piece of paper that the bearded worker said would allow him to see Sweet Mask. He was stopped in front of a giant studio which had a large bodyguard standing in front of the doorway he attempted to get in was soon blocked off after being questioned of his purpose here he showed the guards the paper he was given and he was led into the studio. He was guided by a receptionist towards a waiting area that next to the hero's room. Suddenly another door opened with a man with blonde hair and skin tight shirt and pants came out and moved towards his hero's door assuming it to be him he tried to get the hero's attention but was promptly ignored as the hero went into his room and closed the door behind himself after around 20 minutes the door opened again and the hero came out and walked over to the teen. The style and grace of his movement was marvelous and his clothing was perfect. He gestured for the young teen to stand up and he slowly paced around him and took in his form and hero suit probably being as stunned as he was by his perfect hero costume but the words that left the hero's mouth were nothing but scolding. What are you wearing? It looks awful. If that is your hero suit then it is also highly impractical. The hero's face seemed to grimace as he looked at the teen. When the teen didn't say anything he continued to be annoyed. You look like someone that is begging for attention, but demands the opposite. Regardless, that could be fixed later. What I'm more curious about is what is so special about you and your friends that the Hero Association would go through such lengths to have the S-Class babysit you. Recovering from the hero's harsh words of his outfit which reminded him of a certain creature's visions. He responded, While me and my friends are unique in that we all possess certain supernatural abilities that we call quirks. He made a show of using his naval saber as a demonstration. This is mine. I can shoot out beams from my navel. Sweet Mask rubbed his chin in thought. They probably hope to cultivate their powers but for what? And why the S-Class of all people if anything they should have all came under me I could show them what a true hero is not those nut jobs. He mentally sighed to himself and addressed that teen in front of him. That's very interesting. I assume they assigned your class and rank. I haven't had the time to look over the statistics they sent me from the association. MC class rank 120. I see that's rather disappointing but under my tutelage you shall be a star and everyone in your class will gaze upon with jealousy. But first I have some other matters to attend to throughout the day and you shall be my assistant. Ayama nodded his head and followed behind Sweet Mask as they left the studio. The next stop in the car was for Asui. The frog girl was standing outside in the middle of a street corner. She was advised that an advisor for the hero will come and introduce herself and her to the watchdog man. She waited for five minutes then was greeted by a brunette lady in a similar outfit to all the Hero Association agents. She had a sharp face with makeup on and a jeweled necklace. Hi, you must be the Hero Froppy from the Hero Associations. My name is Dahlia and I'm the Q Branch Committee Leader. Nice to meet you, she said, holding out her hand which Asui shook. Hello nice to meet you as well, Ribbit. I'm sure you're curious about where Watchdog Man is and why I ask that we meet here. Well before you meet the great hero and given what the association has said about you being new to everything, I wanted to explain to you few things before we get to him. The two began walking as she continued. As you may know now this is Q City, one of if not the safest place in the whole world, and that is all because of him. The great Watchdog Man is the sole hero and has taken care of all monsters who have sprouted up rather swiftly and mercilessly. Her attitude and tone of voice as she spoke reminded Froppy of a tour guide. However he is a man of few words and also is usually as still as a statue, unless there is danger present. This caught Froppy attention. Wait, you're saying that he doesn't move unless a monster appears. Ribbit. Well not quite he does move around occasionally for his walks. That's part of the reason we couldn't come to the association to meet you there. We already used up the number of walks he takes during a day. There were some people that really wanted him there for a party, and the association insisted on his attendance. While we don't know why he does things this way we assume that it's because of his love and care for Q-City. He is the sole protector of it after all, so if he is not here when danger strikes then the results could be disastrous. That sounds like a lot of pressure to just put on one person. Ribbit, why don't other heroes operate in the city? It would be, for any other hero but not for him. Other heroes don't operate here because it's poor grounds for advancement. So most heroes that are above C-Class tend to avoid this place as their spotlight would no doubt be overshadowed by Watchdog Man himself. Speaking of the great man, there he is she said as she stuck out her hand. Froppy followed the hand to its destination to see a man in an all-white dog costume sit atop a statue. 
It's said that the reason he chose to put his hero post here near the most popular train station and out of Q City was to get a smell of everyone who enters and leaves the city, so that he can keep tabs on everyone and know if they're in danger by the sense of smell alone. Are you saying that he has such a good sense of smell that he can tell an individual's position no matter where they are in the city? Froppy said with shock, to which the committee leader just shrugged her shoulders. No one knows for sure but it's a popular fan theory as he's able to always be there when someone is in trouble inside the city and he can often tell that a monster appears before the sirens even begin to go off. He's a really amazing person. Froppy looked at the man in costume in a new light. Maybe she will be able to learn something after all. They both began to approach the podium that he stood on. Dahlia held her hand out for Froppy to stop as she continued. Hey, hey, watchdog man. I brought you the playdate that the association assigned to you. A sudden breeze swept the area and Froppy could have swore she heard some sniffs coming from behind her but when she turned around nothing was there and as she turned back around to face watchdog man again she was a bit surprised when the hero was no longer on the podium but in front of her face sitting down like a dog with his hands in front of him on the ground. Hi my name is Asui, but you can call me Tsu. She held out her hand but the hero did nothing but stare at it and sniffed it. Dalai came up behind her whispering in her ear before she spoke again and said, Shake, to which watchdog man instantly responded putting his paw suit in her hand and said hello, with a very low monotone voice. After shaking her hand he immediately went back to his post up on the podium as still as a statue. Dahlia tapped her on the shoulder and explained, as the name implies, Watchdog Man acts like a vigilant guard dog and his mannerism on duty reflects as such. So when speaking to him it would be wise to speak as if you were talking to an actual dog. He is not always guaranteed to reply but he is more open to that sort of language. Well, how am I supposed to train under him if he doesn't talk? For that I have no idea. But you should watch him carefully if you can and see if you can't learn a few things. She was about to ask what she meant by if she could when suddenly a large gust of wind blew by and nearly knocked her off her feet. It was the same from the direction of Watchdog Man and she turned to see that he wasn't there anymore. There he goes again off to the rescue. This yellow dot represents us and this red dot represents Watchdog Man. Froppy was stunned the red dot was 30 kilometers away. She signaled for her to brace herself as the red dot came back nearly instantly and there he was back on the podium again. Good boy, watchdog man, here have a treat. He's more responsive to treats and people who pass by also offer him food as a sign of thanks or to just clean off the podium from monster blood. And that should be everything you need to know. Any questions? Asui mentally sighed to herself why she had to get the weird one. But there was something cute about this hero's weirdness. The last stop was for Maita. He was surprised to find that King stayed at a regular old apartment and it wasn't even a fancy one at that. While it did have at least a view of the bustling city below, that was all it had. He was given a document to give to the receptionist for his authority to be there and enter apartment, and was shocked to find that there wasn't even security at the front gate either. The guy made this king sound like All Might the strongest man in the world. He expected more like a mansion or an estate with guards and more importantly hot babes in a line stretching forever long or at least to be welcomed by maids in cute outfits. But nothing just a regular apartment complex, maybe this hero association didn't pay well enough for that. He probably should ask when he gets back. Minto approached the desk and said he was there to see King. After some initial reluctance to believe the teen he handed her the paper he received. Her tune instantly changed and even gave him a spare key to his room and where it was. Minto was about to proceed upstairs towards the designated room but he thought better of it. Even if he's technically allowed and expected to be there. Someone's room is still their personal privacy, and he wouldn't want to violate that by entering by himself so he decided to just wait outside in the lounging area. It held many images and self-promotion by the king apparently, which makes sense given that he's such a strong hero but thanks to this he could at least match a name to a face. The man he was looking for had blonde hair with a three scratch mark down his left eye. The man didn't look especially powerful from how he looked. If anything he looked pretty scrawny but maybe he had a similar ability like All Might where he has a muscle form or perhaps he would have a ranged ability. His pondering lead his curiosity in picking up a pamphlet called King's Greatest Defeats. He opened up the pamphlet and the first page showed a menacing villain who was all purple with two antenna on the most stunning detail on the page was the giant text that read Threat Level Dragon. The creature could shoot energy beams from his eyes and balls of energy from his hands but King defeated him without a scratch. The next page was a giant humanoid feature with a white skull face its details read Dragon Level Threat. 270 meters tall giant killed by King without a scratch. Flipping the page again was a group effort it was said that King and the S-Class destroyed the alien invaders that destroyed a city. 
The print read that while the details about the event are scarce it is heavily suggested by the association that King and Tatsumaki are the leading figures of the climactic battle that lead to the hero's victory where mostly all of the S-class heroes were unscathed by the assault. Mind to flip the page again and this time the image was of King himself and the text read beware the King's engine for it is the sign of imminent death to the sounds of a human heartbeat. Monsters below that of demons are left stricken in fear by the mere sound of it alone. Mindu was getting incredibly excited about meeting this man after reading this pamphlet all the things this man could teach him and if these people truly didn't have quirks then it's possible to for him to learn from King and maybe gain some power his own with that maybe he could really help Midoriya with his problems and not just be seen as a burden. He contemplated for some time about that before checking the time and wondering when King would return home and what business occupied him for so long. No doubt it had to be some super important thing. Maybe a secret mission, or another dragon-level monster to fight. Thank god I managed to get here in time. I managed to snag the limited edition of the new love game simulator Heartthrop Sisters. The greatest hero thought as he walked out of the video store he was anxiously wanting to get home to play it before any more monsters appeared in front of him like previously. His thoughts were momentarily interrupted by someone yelling loudly behind him. Hey, hey didn't you say back that you had an important mission to accomplish? Why the fuck did we just go shopping with you and this nobody? Looking over his shoulder he saw the S-class hero demon cyborg, with three other people, a bald guy, and an angry blonde teen and a teen with mixed white and red hair. It is of the utmost importance to make it to any available food store sale to save money, and that nobody is the greatest hero and my master Saitama, show some respect when you address him. Before the bald man could interject King had turned around hoping to not be spotted by Demon Cyborg, but suddenly the monster siren started blaring and a sudden shadow overcame his form and the ground started to shake near him. King took a glance to his left to see a giant machine standing there no doubt staring at him. The robot had a regal theme to it with gold ornaments over black plating with a fur cape and crown to match. It began to speak to him stating that it was there to fight him to gather information for some organization. He tried to make a bluff touting his status to the bot in hopes to make it back down but it just angered it further and it twirled a sword and pointed it right him stating that he needed to fight the strongest being for combat data for this organization. Quickly thinking on his feet King let out that he needed to use the restroom and that when he does his power is cut in half so he couldn't be reliable as he is now. Fortunately this got him some time, 10 minutes to be precise on the ultimatum that for every minute he's over he would kill 10 people, which got his anxiety pumping. The group of heroes watched as the strongest hero walked off towards the bathroom and saw as the machine waited. Do you really think it is okay if we just sit here and wait for this guy? Todoroki questioned. No, this is the perfect opportunity to see the king's abilities firsthand. Gino said, I'm kinda interested myself, that monster looks tough. Saitama added, What? You two can't be serious, if that's a monster, it's our job to destroy that scrap heap. If you chumps aren't going to do anything then I will, just let a real hero take care of this. Bakugo began to walk towards the machine when his hand was grabbed by Gino's. I detect a powerful energy from it. It's definitely a machine and its performance may even be greater than mine and I estimate its threat level to be demon. From the statistics that were given to me about you, you're only at the level of a class. You have no hope of beating it. Don't needles throw your life away. The teen snarled and snatched his hand away from his teacher and kept moving forward. Don't underestimate me. The people at the association simply made a mistake and I'll prove it now. Gino said nothing and let the boy continue on with his futile effort he didn't really care one less annoyance to deal with. The second teen Todoroki attempted to call his friend back but thought better of it and decided to approach the creature with him instead. Much to the blonde's annoyance, I didn't ask for your help, Todoroki. Trying to convince you to not do this would probably fail so it would be best just to help you instead and I don't disagree with your assessment. If this thing is going to go on a rampage it would only be wise to stop it before it can even if King does return. Simply nodding his head, Bakugo turned his attention back to the robot that didn't move at all or recognize their presence even with Bakugo taunting it. Feeling ignored Bakugo anger got the best of him and attacked using his AP. Shot auto cannon the round simply dissipated on the machine's chassis not even leaving a scratch. The machine still remained motionless almost inactive taking this as an insult Bakugo attacked again with an even stronger shot which still didn't harm the machine and still it didn't move from its spot. Bakugo charged forth as Todoroki used his ice powers to freeze the machine's legs and joints. Bakugo hit the machine with a fully charged blast creating a smoke cloud only to reveal the machine looking directly at him. Eleven minutes has passed and King has not returned. You shall be the first of ten to die. 
Backquill began to worry but the machine was then completely frozen in ice. Todoroki yelled at his friend to retreat from the machine but to his surprise the machine had already broken out of his ice with its sword. It began to chase Backquill gaining ground on him as he flew away. He yelled at his friend to instead to fly upwards fast as he prepared a large fire wave with his left side. The flames engulfed the robot and the street behind it but the robot remained standing only the foot of his cape caught fire which it put out with one swipe of its hand. The machine activated its back boosters and launched itself at Shoto, ignoring the peppering fire raining down from above from Bakugo. Todoroki created an ice wall to separate himself from the charging behemoth, but it was immediately cut down with one stroke of its sword. It raised its sword ready to cut down but in a surprising event activated its booster to fly upwards hoping to skewer Bakugo in a surprise attack. Bakugo had a quicker reaction time than the robot thought as it nearly missed the teen and only scored a cut on his cheek as the teen redirected his body out of the way of the massive sword shooting off another explosion point blank. Unfazed the machine hit Bakugo with with the flat of its sword sending him screening down towards the ground. Bakugo attempted to recover in time but he couldn't and braced for a hard impact that never came. He was caught by Demon Cyborg's master. He quickly struggled out of his grip and wanted to tell him off but he struggled to recover from that attack just now. Alarms started blaring all around them as someone over a speaker reported in. Emergency evacuation A machine weapon is rampaging near Central Park in M City. From witness reports cross-referenced by the association and a class hero has engaged. It's estimated threat level tiger possible escalation to demon. All residents within the area should proceed to the designated safety area. The robot pointing its sword downward towards Todoroki again and charged double-handed at the young hero. Gathering up his ice in one hand he charged a heaven-piercing ice wall to encase the machine but as the ice connected he felt it charge through almost unimpeded. He took a step back to gain more distance but by that time it seemed too late the machine burst through the ice preparing to gore him on its sword but it was held in place by a metallic hand both combatants seemingly in shock turned to see none other than Demon Cyborg. He quickly disarmed his opponent by using the elbow of his other arm to completely shatter the sword that he held in his hands. This astonished not only the teen next to him but the robot as well taking a step back to marvel at the sight of his broken sword. Taking the initiative Demon Cyborg began to charge his next attack tucking in his right hand and charging energy into it. He told the teen next to him to fall back as he launched a punch that soared through the air and connected with the machine sending him careening back. As Todoroki got back as instructed, he checked to see if Bakugo was okay while the cyborg's master said what was on both teens' minds. Was that a rocket punch? Genos didn't have any time to respond as the robot immediately righted itself with its back thrusters and came in to slam its massive foot on top of the S-class hero. He caught the robot's foot and struggled not to succumb to the pressure against him, his face showing visible cracks as the stress built up. Genos, do you need some help? His master said idly, to the utter bewilderment of the teen standing next to the man. What are you talking about of course he knee. No Todoroki was cut off by Genos. You challenged me to get to the top 10 of the S class and this is the perfect opportunity. I must defeat this on my own. That goes for you too as well. Protect the civilians. I'll handle this. As he spoke he blasted a hole straight through the robot's foot causing it to release some of the pressure and allowing him to escape from under it. He immediately dashed right back into the creature and began hammering away at it with a barrage of blows straight to its chest forcing it backwards. Saitama turned his attention away from the fight and saw a familiar hooded individual running away from the conflict and decided to pursue him. He turned back to Genos and said, Oh, don't lose then, and began to walk away, but was halted by the flaming-headed boy. Where the hell do you think you're going? Isn't that your student? Don't you care about what's going to happen to him? He said that he could win so I believe him. I have to get these groceries home so they don't go bad in this heat. He continued to walk away, leaving the two teens stunned by this man's casualness of the situation. But before they could say more, Thank you sensei, for your trust, Gino said over his battle with the vicious robot. The two teens turned back even more confused than before and watched as the two battled it out, cratering the surrounding area with numerous holes in the concrete. After some time an idea formed in Genos's head if the exterior was too hard to do sufficient damage then attacking the interior would be his greatest shot at beating this machine. He proceeded to dodge a punch from the machine that left it overextended allowing for Gino to jump on its back before placing his palms in the gaps of the creature's armor and using his incineration cannon. 
The blast had the ideal effect. Genos could see the lava pouring from the creature's body as it slumped to the ground. He jumped off and flipped over next to the teens and the civilians. He taunted the machine's shortcomings but was shocked when something else was revealed to be inside a smaller, more round and compact machine. It looked at him quizzically and got into a stance. Sensing an attack coming he told the civilians to get back and for Frozen Phoenix to create an ice wall. And just in time as well the robot began to shoot laser from its head, arms, and legs completely bypassing through some of the ice wall that Todoroki had made but redirecting it away from the civilian who started to flee again. Genos hopped on top of the ice wall ready to engage the machine again dodging lasers left and right. But the machine was getting closer each time no doubt analyzing and finding his patterns of movement he landed next upon a small stairwell of an apartment spotted a fire extinguisher using the object he threw at the, the machine as a distraction momentarily blocking its visual feed so he could break open a water valve which when directed to the flaming carcass of the pilot's mech created a large gust of smoke to envelop the area. The robot spotted Genos through the smoke and attempted to use his laser again just for it to dissipate. The robot found himself tied up and being drawn into Gino who crushed it with his one still functioning arm after exclaiming of a hero that was far stronger than that of King. As the smoke began to clear the two teens rushed in to see if the fighting was truly over with only to come upon a battle damaged Genos who without his clothes on looked completely robotic. This revelation stunned the teen heroes but that quickly turned into cause for concern for at least one of them. Those injuries, are you going to be alright? Todoroki asked. More importantly the hell. You're a robot too. Bakuo inquired. I am a cyborg built by the great scientist for justice Professor Cusino. He will repair me as he always does. Genos responded, which left him with a question. What was he to do with these two? He definitely didn't trust them around and they didn't know where his master lived to go there either. He could send them back to the HQ but their powers had piqued his curiosity about them and the association's dedication to assigning them to the S-Class left him with even more questions. He doubted he could just ask them about it either. He ultimately decided to take them with him to but no one could know where he was located besides the people he utmost trusts, which left him with only one option. The two teens were suddenly taken off guard as Genos had disappeared and before they could wonder what happened to him, their world suddenly went black. Genos shouldered both teens in one hand and while dragging the lifeless G4 machine in the next and headed for S-Lab. Run, just keep running, run as fast as you can without being too suspicious, thought King as he ran away from the scene in Central Park. In the bathroom he started to have a panic attack on what to do. He was utterly terrified of what he could possibly do to stop that machine and cursed his weakness as probably dozens of people will die because of him and the lie he allows to permeate from the association. But a saving grace was that he remembered that Demon Cyborg was in the area so even if the robot was to start attacking people he would no doubt intercept the monster and fight it in his stead. And even if he couldn't defeat the monster by himself he could no doubt hold it off till other heroes arrived on the scene to take it out together. So he kept running. All the way to his home into his apartment practically skipping over the receptionist that tried to tell him something and straight into his room. He decided to try and take his mind off of the events of the day as he tried to play the love simulator that he just bought but a mysterious voice behind him scared the crap out of him. After failing to scare the individual by throwing his title and status around he recognized him from the S-Class meeting in a city. Quickly making up a story to explain the game he was playing was a mispurchase he put on a different mecha action game to play instead. The individual didn't leave as he played and started to ask him questions which he ignored in hopes of having him leave his residence until the question of him fleeing the machine from early sprang up causing him to do a spit take. Luckily he didn't have to answer the questions as alarms started blaring announcing that a demon level threat has been spotted in the area. The hero got up and began to make his way back towards his window to jump out when suddenly a giant crow monster crashed into the apartment. King was flung to the wall and was slumped next to his cabinet. He was astonished to see that the supposed B-Class appeared to stop the bird in its tracks but that could be the fault of the building. He continued to question King asking if he was going to fight the creature, but he was paralyzed and stuck in fear of the creature. But he had to tell the truth to this hero before he got hurt waiting for him to move. He screamed the words as the bird forced its way into the building burying itself inside while most likely eating the B-Class hero but as he opened his eyes, he still saw the man standing there and the bird monster completely out of sight. The man was still there and as he spoke to him, he recognized the voice from so long ago when he first got the scar on his face, of a man with black in a tracksuit defeating the monster that hurt him smiling and asking the same question. Upon realizing that this was the man he stole all the credit from he decided to come completely clean to the stranger who revealed himself as Saitama. 
He told him everything but to his surprise. He wasn't angry at all but asked a question of if he would stay weak and lie or become strong and live up to what people thought of him before jumping out the hole the monster made stating that he would come by from time to time to play some video games. Leaving Kingstar struck, staring out the gaping hole of his apartment. What finally drew him out of his stupor was the sound of his front door unlocking and a small purple teen coming into his room. Confused he began to wonder who the kid was but stopped as the teen fully looked at the wreck that was his apartment. Lo, the teen ran up to the hole in the wall and looked down at the carcass of the bird monster that hit the building. You really are strong. I hadn't noticed when you came in because I was on my phone but the receptionist let me know. The alarm started blaring so I was forced to evacuate with everyone else as they saw it fly directly here. You're so cool that things must be like a thousand times the size of a normal one and you beat it without a scratch like the magazine said you could. The teenager said, Hold on, who are you? And why did you have the key to my room? King asked, Oh, um, my name's mine to the hero grape juice from the association. They sent me here to train under you remember. They gave me a key to your room to come in but I thought it would be polite to wait for your return first. Minta said, slightly confused. Oh, yeah I remember that. Crap I completely forgot about that king thought. So you really beat that crow huh? It was said to be a threat level demon which from what I read is a threat to an entire city. While wow, you sure are strong. King sat and thought to the boy's words of praise. He didn't like lying to people and after talking to Saitama the person he would no doubt steal the credit from again for this, decided to be more honest for once. No, I didn't do it, someone else was here and he took care of it. King said straightly. Maita was caught off guard by that statement. No one else was in the room or left the room as he would have seen them walking up there, and everyone else was evacuated from the building once it was clear that the bird was heading straight for it. But remembered what he read about King in the magazine of how he never liked to brag about his power and would often understate his abilities to the public. So he went along with the man and dropped the topic. Well what are you going to do now? Minda asked. King honestly didn't know the answer. His room was in complete ruins now with a giant hole to the streets below but he was so exhausted from the day's events both mentally and physically that he just wanted to relax for a moment. He went to pull out two handheld devices from his closet and offered one to the teen and said, well I'm probably going to have to pack my stuff up and be prepared to move somewhere else soon but I can always do that later for now. Do you want to play some games? He offered the boy a device. Oh, definitely. Taking the device in his hands and sitting down on the floor playing games with King until the hotel could properly find new homes for everyone in the apartment complex while rebuilding took place. Building some muscle, Darkshine, Kirishima, Pig God, Sato. Kirishima followed Darkshine into a large gym area. It looked normal to what he was used to with a number of machines scattered around the room to work out different parts of the body even having a boxing ring off to the center which became apparent to him that they were approaching. The only thing that stuck out as odd to him was the cylinder transparent tube sticking out of the wall. What's with that tube there? He said while pointing at the object in question. Stopping and looking at where the young teen was pointing, Darkshine replied, Oh, that, that's just a gravity chamber. As the name implies it increases the gravity of the objects inside. I had the hero association to create something like that so I could train with some of the weights in here but it's in need of an upgrade. Even with the heaviest weights in here with 100x gravity it's not much of a workout for me. Hearing so much manliness temporarily made Kirishima's mind explode for just a moment and thousands of questions popped into his head but he collected himself before speaking next. Damn man, that's hardcore. I'm curious how high I could go in there. Kirishima thought out loud, which caused Darkshine to laugh a bit. I like your enthusiasm but I think it would be better to start you off with something that you can handle and work up to that point. Even only a 2x increase in gravity can cause significant problems as not only does it affect you externally but internally as well. At the beginning I could only handle 15x gravity, he said as he continued to walk towards the ring. Kirishima continued behind Darkshine digesting the information he was just told. So what are we going to do first? Well first, I'm really curious about your ability um quirks I think you guys call them. Kirishima nodded. Well as someone that prides himself on his muscles being an impenetrable fortress I wanted to see how your quirk measures up. Both the student and teacher got into the ring and began to walk towards the center. Okay, so try to get as hard as you can and I'll tap you to see how durable you really are. Alright sounds like a plan, but just to let you know, in my hardest form my body morphs a bit. Darkshine nodded his head and watched as the teen started to activate his ability. The skin around his arms and legs started to become enshrouded by a hardened material, and his body began to fracture and splinter with hard rock edges. His hand turned into hardened claws. Even his hair was completely spiker and his teeth became elongated and even sharper. 
he looked like a monster in this state and Darkshine understood why their parents may not have wanted him around regular people and heroes that might mistake him as such. Alright here it is, Red Riot Unbreakable my hardening quirk pushed to its absolute limit. Give me your best shot. Okay, get ready Darkshine extended his open hand and simply patted Kirishima on the back, the blow having an immediate effect on the teenager and flattening him, face first into the mat. He was momentarily worried for the teen as he didn't move for some time and the armor from his back shattered and began to fall off and disintegrate as it left his body, which Darkshine noted as being interesting. He began to stir after about three minutes, coming to and sitting up on the ground and holding his shoulder that Darkshine hit. Dang man, you really are strong. I don't think I've felt a hit that hard since Gigantamasia. Giant Ohu. Nakia, he was a villain from back home. He was a giant that could grow to 82 feet tall and he hit like a truck but I think you got him beat. Hiroshima said getting helped up by Darkshine. I see, who beat him? Well it took a combined effort of a bunch of heroes to beat him. One of my classmates helped me be responsible for drugging him and which made him tired enough for a hero to knock him out later on. But if you were there we may not have even needed that. Fascinating. Moving along well now let's see how well you attack. I'll stand here and you will attack as hard as you can. Don't worry about holding back not a thing in this world could harm these muscles, he said as he began to flex. Hiroshima nodded and retook his unbreakable form and lined up his punch and hit Darkshine with a full-blown red gauntlet. But as the punch connected it was like punching enhanced steel he started to hold his and shake in pain. I see, well that's where we are. So from this I'll suggest we first bulk you up, build up some muscle and add natural durability which if my theory is correct should also improve upon your quirk. You should look up in your free time what sort of body type you would like to strive for. Now let's get started over there with some basic weight lifting but first we need to stretch to get the blood pumping. Hiroshima enthusiastically agreed and began to follow Darkshine work regiment after a couple of hours had passed and two people entered the gym with them as Hiroshima was taking his break. It was Sato and his teacher Pig God who held a platter of sweets and bakery treats in his hand, eating them as he walked. Rarely see you in here Pig God, Darkshine said. I'm here because of him. Getting him stronger would be the best chance to improve his ability, Pig God replied. As the two teachers conversed, Sato walked over to Kirishima who was sitting on a bench drinking some water. Yo, how's your time going with your pro? Hiroshima asked. Sato just sighed this entire time he just had me bake those treats for him. I think he only chose me because he likes desserts and things. Sounds rough, my teacher is super manly. He is even more durable than me and can hit as hard as Gigantamasia. Well, for real. Dang wish I got to train under him with you. Sato replied. Don't worry you'll get your chance. Pig God said from behind him. Spooking Sato as he was surprised that someone that big could move so quickly and quietly. Starting today you will report here with Kirishima and train with them and then report to me after their second break. Speaking of breaks, breaks time over Kirishima back to work. That goes for you too, new kid. Darkshine said. Hiroshima went and walked over to the last machine he was last located on and began to work out his legs. Sato held out his hand to Pig God which he looked at quizzically with an eyebrow raised. What are you reaching for? I'm um, the sweets. I need 10 grams of sugar to activate my quirk. Isn't that why you had me bake them? Now why would I do that? Didn't you tell me that your quirk is a multiplier? What benefit would training do with it? You won't get any stronger like that. Sato sat and thought about what the hero said and then mentally kicked himself for being so stupid in his training so far. Of course as a multiplication his power is only as strong as his base state. Training while consuming sweets doesn't help him at all. Yeah, you're right. Thank you and went over to Kirishima and Darkshine getting instructed on how he will train. With Pig God waiting on the sidelines eating his buffet of sweets. Learning the basics, Bang, Chiranko, Midoriya, Ajiro. The car ride to Bang's dojo was uneventful. Midoriya would occasionally ask questions about building and landmarks as they passed trying to absorb as much information about the city as possible while Ajiro sat and thought on Bang's martial arts. If it is true that everyone here was quirkless and this guy was in any way shape or form as strong as the 1S class hero they met before then he was hopeful that he could learn a lot from Bang. The car slowed to a stop in front of a mountainside and for a moment Midoriya and Ajiro were confused. Welcome to my dojo, Bang said with his eyes closed and hands behind his back. Um, where sir? Ajiro asked before he and Midoriya gasped as he disappeared before their eyes. Up here, the old man said yelling at them from semi atop the mountain on a cliff face waving back at them. Before turning around and continuing upwards, Ajiro and Midoriya first looked at each other before nodding and proceeding upwards after the old man. 
Midoriya activating full cowling at 50% scaling the mountain in record time while Ajiro used his tail to catapult himself up the mountain but at a much slower pace than Midoriya. Midoriya made it to the top of the mountain just as he saw Bang reach the gates of his dojo and turned around to face him. Oh, you're fast young man. Not many can make the journey up here as fast I can. Your friend is still on his way up I presume. Midoriya nodded and the two waited for him to arrive, taking around two more minutes to arrive up the mountain slightly winded. Excellent. Now that you two are here I would like you to meet your fellow student, Chiranko. We have two fellow students for you to meet. The old man said while entering the dojo, the two teens saw another man with brown spiky hair in a karate gi approach them and offered a bow. Hi, I'm Chiranko Bang's best student. He bragged, bowing in return. Ajiro and Midoriya both greeted their fellow disciple. Ajiro looked around the dojo confused. Where is everyone one else? The question causing Bang to noticeably shake and be thrown off balance, Midwaria noted. An incident happened some time ago with a fellow student here. He went on a rampage one day forcing Bang personally to deal with him and throw him out. But the fear never left my fellow students' heart so they never came back. From then on Bang's dojo was treated like a curse no one wanted to train here due to the potential of that student coming back again and running wild. Also the topic is highly sensitive to Bang so it's best not to bring it up. He whispered the last part disparagingly as they all looked to Bang, who simply sighed as he closed his eyes and remembered the memories of all the students who once littered the dojo and opened them up to being just an empty shell. He fixed his composure again, walked to the center of the dojo and turned to face his students. What is done in the past, can't be undone but I look to you all as the future. As long as the fist of the flowing rock passes after I'm gone I will be happy. Now usually I would start with a demonstration of my martial arts, but first I would like to measure my two new students first. Midoriya if you don't mind approaching the center. Midoriya nodded and continued forward along with Ajiro and Chiranko but as he got to the edge both got into a kneeling position just as they met the edge of the ring area as Midoriya continued forward. He got to the center near Bang and was asked to get into a stance. Giving a signal to his student, Chiranko started to count down to begin the match. Begin. Midoriya started out at 50% full cowling starting out with a right hook, which Bang sidestep easily, causing him to fly past him. Swinging back around he came back with a roundhouse which Bang dodged again without even looking at him tilting his body just so the attack barely missed. Midoriya tried next to sweep his legs but failed as well. Having Bang jump over the sweep and in mid-air turn around to face the teen, he was slightly surprised to see projectiles fly from the teen's gauntlet which he dodged while in mid-air. He held out his hand for the boy to stop. You don't have to hold back young man, I'm a lot stronger than I look. Midoriya gasped and was confused on how he could tell but nodded in understanding anyways. Raising full cowling to 100% causing the lighting around him to become more pronounced and his hair to lighten up noticeably. Earning gasps from the audience on the sidelines. Putting his hand down, Bang nodded for the boy to continue. Midoriya tried again for a straight strike but the blow was diverted off center causing him to stumble away behind Bang still using the momentum he pushed off his feet towards the wall. He was moving towards and bounced off preparing a Manchester smash, but again he hit nothing but empty air correcting himself and landing on the opposite wall he charged forward again his arm back in a Detroit smash position but. When he swung he found himself suddenly on the ground one of his arms behind his back and bang over top of him with his leg on his back. I see, you do have the power and speed fitting of the S class but your attacks are too straightforward and easy to read. You remind me of a lot of metal bat in that way. He released his hold on the boy's arm and helped him get up, gesturing him to return to the side with his fellow students and adding that Ajiro should come take his place. If he couldn't touch you, I doubt I could do much better, Ajiro said. Now now, don't look down on yourself. We all have our strengths and weaknesses. This is not necessarily about winning but an examination of sorts. Statistics sent by the association are one thing but you always gather better ideas when experiencing it firsthand. Bang replied, nodding to Chiranko again. He began to count down for the match to begin as he counted down Ajiro and got into a stance mostly known in karate as Dachai. His legs spread apart with one hand cocked back while the other is extended in front of his body. Bang replied with his own stance his arms cascading in front of him until ending up besides his body looking similar to a praying mantis type stance from their world. He swore he could see faint blue lights around his hands as they moved but it could have been a trick of the mind. The match began and Ajiro immediately charged forth, trying to land any hit he could with punches, kicks, or sweeps but they were all deflected or dodged by Bang. He jumped into the air trying for a tail swipe but that too was deflected by Bang grabbing the tail and swinging him around before throwing him away. 
Ajiro stabilized in midair using his tail to plant into the ground granting him a foothold. He landed and using his tail launched pieces of the floorboard at Bang as cover for his next move. Bang easily deflected all of the debris aimed at him and sidestepped the jump kick flung his way, but forgot about Ajiro's tail which wrapped around his ankle and attempted to pull him off his feet. Only being slightly surprised Bang used their connection and pull of his ankle to perform in handstand and quickly twisting his legs forcing Ajiro into the air and down to the ground as he slammed his leg down, causing Ajiro to land face first into the ground. Not letting the boy recover he quickly took hold of the boy's tail with one hand and the back of his neck with the other pinning him to the ground and signaling the end of the match. He helped the boy get up and explained his thoughts. You see your tail is your greatest weapon but don't forget it can also be your greatest weakness. You rely on it too much and neglect your body causing an imbalance in your fighting. He gestured for the boy to go sit with the rest of them and began with his normal class showing them and explaining the intricacies of the water stream rock smashing fist. An assassin's test, Ida, flashy flash. Ida walked behind his teacher as they walked the halls of the building passing by numerous rooms and going down numerous elevators to get down to what appeared to be a sub-level of the base. He tried to strike up a conversation with the hero during their travels, but he didn't answer any of his questions. He didn't even register that he existed, making Ida partly think that maybe the hero could be deaf but he heard his name when he was announced to the center to collect him from the gymnasium so he summarized that he's just being incredibly rude. The atmosphere of the place screamed to Ida that this wasn't a place he wanted to be. The doors were more reinforced and locked, like they were designed to keep people inside like a prison, but he thought that it would be inconceivable for a hero agency to also contain a prison under it. But if they truly were in some alternate reality then his preconceived notions on what is acceptable would probably need to revalued for this new system. The two continued to walk towards a specific door, Flash signaling him to wait outside and opening the door to the room, allowing him to peek inside and see a man handcuffed to a chair, his arms, forearms, legs, and even his ankles tied together by thick metal braces. Was this man really that dangerous to require such harsh restraints? The man's eyes seemed to light up as he saw Flash enter and he smiled and called out a greeting before the door closed and he couldn't see or hear anything anymore. Time flew by Ada keeping an internal counter as he was on his phone texting his friends seeing if they were okay, some replying instantly others not being able to for whatever reason. He decided on exploring the web and collecting more information on the heroes of this world. It seems there are multiple fan groups for different heroes sending him down the internet rabbit hole completely absorbing his attention until there was a slight muffled thumb from the cell. He was sitting next to and the door opened revealing Flash as calm and collected as ever gesturing him to follow him again. Looking back at his phone, the time elapsed was around 20 minutes. He turned around to look inside the room at the man again just to see that he was no longer bound in the chair, and he couldn't see him from his point of view. But what he could see made his jaw tighten on the walls that were completely white before were splashes of red that looked eerily similar to blood. Before he could investigate further the door closed leaving only his imagination on what happened. He followed more loosely behind Flash than previously he was not sure about this hero. From what he read online the only thing sharper than his looks was his blade. His eyes dropped to his the blade on his belt that he could see every so often as his cape swayed from left to right. It was there where he saw it almost imperceptible but the red dot clashing heavily with the white cape. Blood that could only be from one source, he thought. He tried to keep his trepidations under control as he was led into a designated training zone. The landscape was mostly cluttered with rocks big and small and nothing else really notable. To Ida's surprise he started to speak as they approached the center of the area. You have 30 minutes to try and land a hit on me, I will not use any weapons. Sir, are you suggesting this to test my abilities? Ida questioned, confusingly. He would assume the data the association collected yesterday would have been enough to avoid situations like this. More or less, consider it an evaluation. I've seen your file by the association, but I have my own metrics that I would like to confirm. The time's ticking. Come at me. Simply nodding his head, Ida activated his risopreo burst, his engines firing up and smoke coming out of his mufflers. Charging forward jumping up and doing a spin hook kick the blow seeming going completely though flash like he wasn't even there. Flash called from directly behind him causing Ida to turn in surprise to see him behind him. He charged again using a forward snap kick that Flash sidestepped the blank expression on his face seemingly suggesting to Ida that it was casually dodged. He tries again multiple snaps kicks all dodged easily, trying and failing to land a hit. The last blow launched was a roundhouse kick that once his rotation completed was shocked to see Flash gone again this time directly behind him causing him to hop backwards some steps to make distance. How is he invading him? 
Is it a quirk? No, this world has never heard of quirks before. Was he really that fast? Ida thought. I'm pretty disappointed so far. I thought you would be better. Flash taunted. Ida didn't take the bait and reply but he did realize that to pass this test he needed to step it into a higher gear. He shouted Risapreo burst turbo, and his muffles began to glow with light, and his flames bleached out the ends. He sped towards Flash launching a kick that to his surprise misses again. The acceleration of the maneuver sending him into a rock destroying it completely. He needed more speed and decided to run around the arena so he can get to top speed before coming back around and rounding on the hero but no connection again. He tried time and time again missing each time. Flash still with that blank look which slightly ticked Ida off. He started trying even harder, mixing mock charges to disguise his true attack. But it didn't work no matter how many he did in between real attacks switching patterns and an angle of his attacks all of it was dodged so easily. With no sign of strain on the hero's face, Ida was closing in on his time limit. Ten seconds left one final play he had in mind where he started his attack like regular coming around at full speed preparing another mock charge. But instead of falling back he used his engine boost to accelerate even faster than before at flash from a stand still performing a kick that missed but carried his momentum into the air and landing down with a axe kick. But still no connection he thought as his engines died down. His eyes wide as Flash seemingly disappeared again, only to hear some clapping from several meters away. That was new, seems there is a modicum of talent in you after all. You have 15 minutes remaining. Hearing his words lifted his spirits somewhat but what is he going to do now? His quirk is in its cooldown period and if he couldn't land a hit then he surely couldn't now. Sir, I would like to relinquish my remaining time. As he said that, Flash's facial features dipped into an angry frown and Ida could feel his contempt just from the hero's gaze. And why would that be? Are you implying that without your quirk, you would refuse to fight? That you would just give up? Do you think you would have the luxury of a timeout in a real battle? He said as he unsheathed his sword making Ida's eyes go wide and his body shake in fear of the implication. His mind flashing back to the prison cell and the blood on the wall. You will continue or you have to survive the next 15 minutes against me fighting back. He resheathed his sword. Ida simply nodded and went at him at a terribly slow pace. The kicks performed before becoming sloppier. His balance and movements less refined. Flash sat there dodging while looking at the pitiful display in front of him and realized after five minutes the boy didn't throw any punches at all. Either now or when he was using his ability, angering him greatly. The sight became so pathetic that he stopped the exercise five minutes early and proceeded to the exit. By the time the boy's senses caught up he was already opening the door from the training center, turning to the teen and giving an ultimatum. Your skills are barely sufficient for the task I have at hand. If you wish to join me, meet me here tomorrow at around noon. Pack whatever you need for a month of travel. But be warned I shall not coddle you on this journey. If you go it is possible that you will die, the choice is yours. With that said Flash left, Ida was puzzled by the man and the choice he gave him, an entire month, separated from his friends, and the possibility of dying making things worse. He would have to discuss it with everyone else to see if he should accompany him or not. Opposites attract. Atomic Samurai, Ian, Bushadrill, Akame Tachi, Siro. Siro was currently following his fellow disciples presumably towards Atomic Samurai hideout. He found the area reminded him of lone samurai movies, complete with a hideout amongst the trees, some even sporting the distinct pink cherry blossoms that would occasionally fall towards the ground. They stepped into a clearing that held one singular building. He nearly laughed at how similar it was to old-school Japanese aesthetics complete with the wooden frame and the style of the roof. The group came to a complete stop and waited in the front lawn, no one making a move to the front door and just sitting down in front of the building in the grass. Aren't we going to head inside? Ciro asked confusingly. No, only those who are considered a part of the Council of Swordsmen are allowed to enter. We shall wait here until our master is ready to come out. Bushadrill stated. Well how long will that take? Ciro questioned. As long as it is needed, kid, you of all people have no right to complain, C-class. Akame Tachi said dismissively. Whoa, I'm not trying to complain or anything but I was just wondering is all. Ciro held up his hands in mock surrender. After that they simply waited and waited and waited. Ciro was getting incredibly bored now. The games he had on his phone were taxing on his phone's battery to play. Especially if he didn't know if he needed it or not. After answering some text from Ida he decided to spend the rest of the time listening to music. It had been about 30 minutes before the door to the hut began to open up. Ciro turned off his music and noticing the others begin to bow in front of the door he followed their example. Atomic Samurai stepped out of the building bowing to his other council members before taking his leave and closing the door behind him. 
He turned to look at his disciples and frowned slightly when he saw the extra member. Yayan, I assume this is the kid from the Hero Association. Siro was about to raise his head to reply, but his head was forced back down by Bushidril, turning to look at the disciple who shook his head at him. Yes, master. His name is Siro, C-Class Rank 125. But that is not all that is troubling, sir. His main form of attack is with the use of tape. The Iron raised his head and answered his master's question. Oh, so not only is he a weakling but he is the complete opposite of what we stand for. Correct master, the Iron said evenly, Ciro mentally chiding himself on how they speak like he's not even there. Looking up and pinching the bridge of his nose, Atomic Samurai let out a sigh. Someone in the association must really like playing jokes. No matter, the mission is a go. We will leave for tomorrow and set sail for the island. The trip should take all but a month before we return again, so you all should be prepared. Ciro shot up at this before Bushidril could push him down again. Wait, am I involved in this? He finally got a good look at the man and he was a traditional lone samurai in almost every sense of the word. Even having a blade of grass in his mouth, he staggered under the hero's steely gaze. He turned his attention back to Iyan. Make sure that everyone is ready. We will gather at the Hero Association headquarters along with the other Council of Swordsmen's members. This shocked the group. Master, is this mission of such importance? Ian asked. Yes, if the information granted by the Association proves to be correct instead of a red herring, then it shall. It will bring us one step closer to what we as an organization have been yearning for. So you all better remain vigilant. I will need to go and prepare myself so you are free to do whatever you need for the day. A resounding yes, Master came from all three disciples' voices and with that atomic samurai began to walk away. He stopped after overhearing the young teen comment on him not answering his question or at least acknowledging his existence before finally turning and talking to the boy directly. I only recognize the strong, I will most likely never acknowledge you. But if you can manage to touch one of my disciples with your tape then I might consider it. A slight chuckle escapes his mouth let's make it a challenge seeing as I don't know what else to do with you. If you can land tape on one of my disciples then I'll acknowledge you and for the person that does allow themselves to be touched. His face turning serious. I don't want to see your face around me again. With that he left and began his way through the clearing of trees. Ciro cursed himself for speaking. Now all around him, the three disciples were guarded around him. All of them taking a step back and hovering over their blades like he was preparing to attack them at any moment. Guys, guys come on. I'm not going to do anything to harm your relationship with your master. You don't have to worry about me. I swear, I would like to see your power firsthand anyways so I would request a duel. Yayan said, causing his fellow disciples to gawk at him. Are you sure that is a good idea Yayan? You heard what the master said correctly. Bushidril said, I understood his message well and I will not allow a single strand of tape to touch my body as expected. But if he is to fight by our side... It is smart to know of his capabilities. This piqued Ciro's interest. Fight by your side. What? Are you dumb too, kid? Master made it abundantly clear that everyone will accompany him on this trip. Were you not listening? Akame Tachi stated. Oh, I see. That's something I have to prepare for. Ciro thought to himself. As he followed Iyan into another clearing away from the house to begin the duel. Both sides started 50 meters apart and Bushadrill gave the countdown to begin. Once the match officially commenced Ciro shot out one roll of tape from his left elbow. The iron did not move or attempt to attack and to his surprise even closed his eyes staying in position until suddenly the tape hurling at him completely disappeared in front of him. A long roll of tape reduced to nothing but confetti, Ciro tried again and again only getting the same result. He was stomped and before he could try and think of something else to try instead he felt the cold feel of metal pressed against his throat. Shocking as the only thing he could see of Ian moving was the flow of leaves and shredded tape hovering in the air from the position he just moved from. The match was over and maybe from being emboldened by Ian the other wanted to test him out as well. Siro mentally sighed to himself thinking that it would be a long day. We all float, Tatsumaki, Yuraraka. Yuraraka was currently gazing at the landscapes below her, countless buildings and structures passed down below her at incredible speed, like she was in an invisible jet. At first once she realized that Tatsumaki was elevating in height taking her with her she was scared of falling or crashing into stuff, but that quickly left her mind as for the past 10 minutes nothing happened, so she decided to enjoy the ride and ponder where the girl was taking her. Her question was soon answered as she started to fall down from the sky slowly going down towards the ground, eventually hovering mere feet above it before being dropped unceremoniously. Looking around there was nothing of note to the area, it was just a mostly barren landscape. Between cities. Um, why are we here exactly? She asked hesitantly. Isn't it obvious we're here to train your Esper's abilities duh? 
Tastumaki said while crossing her arms and beginning to glow green, lifting up several small rocks. My Asper WH Uraraka began to ask before dodging out of the way of several rocks being tossed at her. Wait wait, she tried to say but to no avail as she dodged more rocks that were aimed at her. There is no waiting. As a hero you should never expect someone to come rescue you. As an Asper you should at least be able to create a barrier to protect yourself. Tatsumaki said as she threw more small pebbles at her. Wait I'm not a Asper. Hiroraka got out as she dodged rocks from the floating girl, causing her to stop her barrage and the green glow surrounding the girl to vanish. What do you mean? You're not an Asper. Your file said you could float and levitate objects. She snapped angrily at the team. Well yes I can, but not the way I assume you can. She raised her hand, outstretched showing her fingers these small pads that I have on my fingers are my quirk. Anything I touch with all five of them loses gravity's effect on them, causing them to float. She demonstrated by picking up one of the small rocks that was thrown at her, touching it with her fingers and pouncing it up into the air, where it kept upwards at a constant steady pace. Tastumaki watched the rock float and looked back at her surprised. Is that it? Is that really all you can do? That's such a weak power. What do you expect to do with that? How do you expect to fight monsters with that? She said while getting somewhat angry at the girl. Well fighting bad guys isn't everything there's to being a hero. My power can come in handy with rescue work. And someone being weightless can completely throw off how they move and at least create openings that can be exploited by other heroes. She reasoned. Tatsumaki only let out a loud sigh. She reminded her of her sister, trying to overcome her own shortcomings with the people around her. That mentality made people weaker and kept them stagnant, never improving themselves to what they could achieve if they only thought of themselves. This girl was in a worse state than even her sister given her lack of ability but if she truly wanted to go down this path, she needed to try harder to be independent. And what if you're the only hero available? Are you just going to let monsters just do what they want? Hell if your opponent can fly, your power is essentially worthless, maybe even if they had a rope or something that anchors them to the ground. Do you have any offensive abilities at all? She said her tone full of contempt and disdain. Uraraka was somewhat angry by the hero's tone of voice but understood that from the questions asked she was only trying to look out for her safety. Well I have some knowledge in martial arts and I have these hooks that I have contained in my gauntlets that I use to grab and throw things that I make weightless. She said while demonstrating how her gauntlets work picking up four stones that hovered around them. Seeing this Tatsumaki gave her an idea. The green light returned to her body once more she asked. Tell me is there a limit to this power of yours? Yes a weight limit actually. I think from the test my upper limit is 91 tons if I really push myself but I get really nauseous. But I'm comfortable at 10 tons. She smiled at herself thinking of when she first started UA how she came so far from her limit of 3 tons. I see not very much then. She said, shocking Uraraka but before she could question her about it a deep rumbling started to happen around her suddenly a large chunk of rock sprouted out of the ground behind Tatsumaki eclipsing both of them and casting a huge shadow. Uraraka was frightened about her attention with this giant rock structure and even more afraid at the lack of difficulty she had when summoning it. Suddenly the rock came apart in eight chunks and those chunks were crushed and condensed into small cube shapes. That rock just now was around 60 tons give or take. I want you to lighten all eight cubes. She shot the cubes forth and while it was not aimed at Uraraka directly, she still stepped back as the eight cubes landed near her and is expected betraying their size. The holes they created were a decent size bigger than the actual object themselves. Uraraka approached the eight object hesitantly and tapped the first one already feeling the weight of the cube weighing in on her comfortability, but otherwise being fine. The second cube she already began starting to feel somewhat okay. And this continued on her conditions getting worse and worse as she went from cube to cube. By the time she arrived at the seventh cube she was shaking and her stomach being tied in knots. When she touched the seventh cube she started to feel the water pool in her mouth as reading itself for her to throw up. But she was persistent to keep moving forward to the eighth cube. When she got to it she stared at it mentally preparing herself for the and letting her body get accustomed to the weight she's currently supporting and she went for the last cube tapping it and buckling under the pressure. She just on her knees on the ground the cubes hanging loosely by the hooks from her gauntlets. Tatsumaki waited patiently for the girl to stand surprised that she was struggling so much with so little weight. The girl finally shakily got to her feet. Took you long enough. All right you better be ready to begin again. Cause here it comes. Shock filled Uraraka features as she watched as that familiar green glow surrounded Tatsumaki once again lifting small rocks and sending it at her. 
angel or demon, sweet mask, Ayama. Ayama was flung through the air, his back suddenly coming to a stop as his back hit the far wall of the training gym that the sweet mask rented out for them. From spending time with handsomely sweet mask, he thought that he was everything he wanted to be as a hero. He was a star in every sense of the word. He was a singer, dancer, book writer, and movie star, along with his hero work. He reminded him a lot of Beast Genus in a way the hero closest to the public, and the one that would reassure the public of the hero's dedication to protecting them from threats. But now, now he was the only threat around and he scared him greatly. He would notice over the course of the day's events that Sweet Mask when alone was a lot less charming and charismatic, quite the opposite especially when pertaining to heroes he disproved of which currently was himself. He struggled to stand as Sweet Mask waited impatiently, tapping his foot and looking down on him with a sense of contempt. Is that really it to your skill and ability? And you want to be a hero with that? The questions he asked Ayama knew were rhetorical at that point. Anytime he tried to answer his responses only served to make the hero angrier. He finally managed to stand up holding his stomach where he was roughly kicked towards the wall. I expected better, maybe I should take one of your other classmates instead. I remembered you said that two of them were rated as S-class which I would like to check out for myself. God forbid we have two more metal bats running around. You, on the other hand, can be lost with the rest of C-class. Every word out of his mouth stung, partly because he started to agree with him. Maybe someone else should be here instead. Todoroki and Midoriya were both much stronger than him and they were both incredibly heroic, even more so than him. His mind drifted towards that being's visions again. Was he truly not remarkable or memorable to people? Did his infatuation of sparkly things and shine just a way for him to draw attention? As he thought about this his face began to morph into a solemn and sad state, which seemed to agitate Sweet Mask even more. Look at your face. Are you just going to accept what I say is true? A real hero doesn't ever show themselves weak to anyone. You are supposed to be calm, collected, and beautiful at all times, to give people hope and a figure they can admire to be or follow in. If you truly think what I said is true then you can leave my presence right now if not then try and prove me wrong. Ayama looked at the hero as he spoke those words. He wasn't completely trying to dissuade him or berate him but teach him to be a better hero. He wanted to prove that entity wrong and if this was a step into doing that then he would like to train under Sweet Mask more than he wanted to prove to him that he wasn't a complete failure. That he deserved to be a star like him. He began to get into a battle stance and prepared to attack Sweet Mask again. Which from what he saw somewhat elevated Sweet Mask features, meaning he was happy with his choice. Ayama began his assault trying to tag Sweet Mask with a single laser launching multiple at the hero only for him to dodge out of the way or seemingly just phase through as he appeared in another location. While dodging Sweet Mask started to walk towards him menacingly. Is this really all there is to your power? Your attacks are so predictable everyone would tell where you were aiming just by the motion of your hips. He suddenly disappeared from Ayama vision and he was frightened as he talked right behind the young hero. Do you think you will have the luxury of being at long range against your opponent? Again behind him he spoke. If your opponent is faster than you, what then? Are you saying you have no martial talents at all? Ayama thought back to the sports festival and how he was easily beaten by Mina once she disabled him and got close. But he trained and now he has something against close-range opponents. His naval saber extended from his stomach and he flung his body around to slice at Sweet Mask, only to hit nothing and hear clapping behind him, turing to face Sweet Mask some meters away. I stand corrected. You at least thought that through. Although that still leaves the same problems as before, you need to turn your whole body to swing that thing around limiting your range of motion and your range of attack. He suddenly disappeared again but before Ayama could turn around he was suddenly swept off his feet and landed face first into the ground. Like in this position you are completely helpless here. Although a hero should never let themselves be put to the ground but especially in your case as you lose all your options then. He let the boy get up as he walked back over to where he started exclaiming. You have yet to prove yourself to me. If you have anything left you should do it now or I'm dropping you off back towards the association and finding someone else. Panicking Ayama could think of only one more thing he could do. If his normal laser was so easy to avoid then maybe a big laser would find better luck. With a larger laser, he charged his naval laser and unleashed his supernova attack. The beam exploded out of the boy covering almost the entire gym. Sweet Masked was shocked by the size of the beam and only blocked as the beam came closer to him. It landed with a loud bang and just as the beam connected Ayama turned it off, but panicked again as he just came to terms of what he did. But before he could ask to see if Sweet Mask was okay the smoke cleared to see that he was relatively okay and dusting himself off, looking over his clothes only to find that his sleeves had a new hole in them, frowning slightly and taking a deep breath 
and composing himself. Well that's more like it. You may have some hope after all we just need to improve on some things before you're truly ready. And the first thing that needs to improve is your wardrobe. That cape has to be the first thing to go and those red glasses. They look nothing but tacky. Feeling a bit hurt by him assaulting his outfit he was no less happy that Sweet Mask was going to take him on as a protege. Well, excuse me sir but my suit is actually needed for my quirk. Without it I can't use it effectively. Is that so? Well in that case I'll make a note to the association that allows them to check it over and fashion it into something more fitting for someone that will be traveling alongside one we will get you some casual clothes in the meantime. Almost bounding over to Sweet Mask happily he began to trail after the hero as they left the gymnasium. We can only evolve through experimentation. Drive Knight, Kaminari, Yeyorazu. Yeyorazu and Kaminari were currently walking through what could only be described as an evil laboratory. The entire place was incredibly dark and they wondered if that was just for aesthetic or if the man in front of them didn't need light to see as his body would compensate for it. Kaminari had tried to act tough for her offering to lead the way in some sort of bravado stunt to impress her but that quickly died out as they made their way deeper into the facility especially in one aspect of the facility where some of the man's subjects lied one had reached out to grasp at Kaminari making him jump and instantly jump behind Momo for protection. While humorous she did find the whole thing worrying. A hero seemingly having creatures captured and doing who knows what to them made her worry for their safety under his teachings or if they would leave this place at all. They eventually came to a clearing with a ginormous computer. As the man walked towards it the area began to light up, showing more of the area. There were several clear rooms that held creatures inside them with transparent glass. Some after seeing them started begging to be let out. Others shone from the glass hoping not to be seen. Gayorazu finally had enough and wanted an answer for what she was seeing but her voice betrayed her feelings of the event. What is going on here? What are you doing to these creatures? Her voice was soft, almost shaky despite wanting to be angry at the sight before her. The man turned around to face them, his single eye looking at her then at the cages the two were looking at, causing all of the creatures inside them to get away from the glass and out of the man's sight. Those are just some monsters I've captured that have taken interest in. They possess interesting abilities that I hope to harvest for myself. Drive Knight said with such lack of feeling or remorse that she began to wonder if his appearance was not just for show, and that he was an actual machine. The thought on her mind must have been racing in Kaminari's head as he came out and asked, Are you a robot or cyborg or something? Or is that just cool armor? I am a cyborg. I have a question for you too as well. If I may, can I receive a sample of your blood? For what purpose would you need that? The association has already taken samples of us for medical reasons in case we need them. She said almost too defensively. As I said before I like to harvest powers that interest me and your powers I can only assume come from a mutation that lies within your biology. And if we refuse. Yeyorazu voice was timid, almost accusingly. You may have me confused. I have no interest in harming you or anyone in your group. The monsters you see around you are just that monsters if they were not caged up in here they would be rampaging around in the cities. Most of them were actually were caught while they were rampaging in the streets. You should not compare yourself to them. If you refuse then we can leave it be. He reassured them. Well I'm not sure, I'm comfortable with handing over my blood to you, especially after we just met. Yeyorazu replied, I'm with her on this one. Not to be mean or anything but this entire place screams spooky and not too trustworthy. Kaminari Owls declined. True to the cyborg's words he showed no signs of anger or any emotion at all for that matter. Only turning back towards the large computer and begging to activate it. That is fair, well alternatively I would like to ask some follow-up questions based on the data the association supplied to me. The computer began to show the data from the tests they performed the other day. He turned back around and gestured to the yellow-haired boy. Your tests were quite interesting. You can absorb 300 million volts of electricity but can only discharge 5 million volts of electricity before your system is overloaded. Do you know why that is? That's a staggering 60x difference. Kaminari was mostly speechless. He couldn't really think of a reason for the difference being that much when he suddenly found something. Well it may have to do with me in my early ages. I was struck by lighting a lot when I used my power during storms. He began to laugh while rubbing the back of his head. I see. So you built up a higher tolerance by getting struck by natural lighting. Another thing about your ability, it was said that you are unable to discharge lighting in a direct way without special tools, why? I don't know, maybe I just need more training with it. When I was growing up I never needed to direct it to a specific point and used it more as a defense mechanism against anything around me. Hum, last question for now it said you can absorb and discharge energy but have you ever done so at the same time? If you have, could this theoretically stop your mental degradation entirely? 
Well, I never thought of it like that. I haven't tried it before but I wouldn't rule it out of the realm of possibility. He said unsurely. He turned his attention to Yairazu who seemed to wither under his gaze. Your quirk was ultimately incredibly interesting to me. It seems like an extremely powerful ability. How does it work? Well, I can create anything that I know the atomic structure of, as long as I have enough fat stored up to create it. It said that you were capable of creating around 5 tons of mass before tiring. I assume that the conversion between fat and the material is incredibly skewed from these results based on your size. Yes, actually, even I don't fully understand the conversion myself, but given my weight class and some basic math I guess it would result in something like 64 pounds of mass per pound of fat on my body. Interesting. Would it not be more convenient for you if you weighed more? If you are worried about looks you shouldn't be as you would inevitably slim down very quickly from using your quirk in combat. Hearing the man say that got Yeyurazu to flush a bit and got a laugh out of Kaminari. You hear that Momo, he said that you should be fa a sudden blow to the stomach from Yeyurazu quickly silenced her friend as she replied to Drive Knight. Not really, while there are some benefits to gain by getting bigger I find it would inhibit me more than it helps me. While it would be better for my quirk and things of that nature it would hinder my physical abilities. Understandably there is always a trade-off to make in such decisions. I hope to run some experiments with you two in the coming days but I must first learn more about your abilities to have a good testing environment for them. I hope you both don't mind answering a few more of my questions. As both gave Metal Knight the okay to continue he continued questioning the young heroes on a number of things regarding their quirks. Don't touch that, Child Emperor, Mina, Gyro, Lao, Eu, Awa. Constant gasps and shock sounds emerged from Mina's mouth as the supposed S-Class hero escorted them through his quarters. They passed by numerous inventions and gadgets that functioned that they couldn't even imagine. Gyro had to constantly rein me in from traveling too far from the pack as she would try to get a closer look at the machines around her. But even Gyro had to admit that what they were seeing was extraordinary. It reminded her of I Island with the drones and robots scattering around performing tasks, or the multiple monitors scattered about displaying contents of locations and numerous scans of varying types. The hero led the group into some sort of testing area where numerous robots were testing equipment. Mina practically bolted when she saw one machine hold something akin to a lightsaber from their world wanting to hold it, only for the machine that was wielding it to turn away from her and dodge every attempt from her to grab it. Finally admitting defeat she turned to the hero and talked in her sweetest voice. Can I please just hold it? She made a pouting face while rubbing her hand behind her back to play up the emperor merely rolled his eyes at the stunt. No, you'll probably end up hurting yourself. It's not a toy and it's going through its final phase of testing. You're younger than me. If you can, surely I could. At least let me take a picture of it. The guys will be so jealous if they see I was by a real lightsaber. Mina pleaded with her hands together bowing. Fine, just a picture. As Child Emperor finished his statement, the robot began to turn around and hand her the saber and took the phone from her hands. She started multiple pauses deciding on which one she should do before deciding on a backwards-facing grip with her other hand held out in front of her, making a pose she seen from Ashoka Tano. The robot took the picture and was going to retrieve the saber and return her phone. Mina was about to attempt to run away to have more time with the energy sword when suddenly her arms were grabbed by a metallic claw. Tracing the claw back to the user she was stunned when it came out of the young boy's backpack. The robot reached her and took the sword while replacing it with the girl's phone. Just as more claws clamped over her arms and legs and lifted her up and dragged her back to them. Looking up into her pouting face with a snide smile of his own. You may be older than me but I'm a lot smarter and more mature than you are, Child Emperor said. Failing to struggle from the claws grasp Mina, let out a sigh and just looked at the kid in front of her. Come on, you can't just show me all these cool things and not expect me to want to try them out. Back me up Gyro, I know you're just as curious as I am. What? Don't bring me into this. While what I'm seeing is cool and all, I can respect the creator's wishes to not touch. Gyro explained making Mina gasp as she was let down and put a hand to her chest in fake hurt. And here I thought you were my friend. You're supposed to back me up. Making Gyro and Child Emperor just roll their eyes at her theatrics. If you were patient, we would have already got to the part where you can touch and test something out already. Child Emperor remarked. This got the pink girl's attention and she jumped up ecstatically. Oh, really? Is it going to be the laser sword? Those missiles. What about something like that backpack of yours? Mina said getting closer to the child in question. 
Nothing that dangerous for you too. Actually it's something to do with your abilities. I believe I made some equipment that should benefit you in combat. He began to walk towards a clear area with a platform rising in the area of a shooting range. As the group made it up to the platform it had fully risen to have what looked like gloves and bracelets in the next. Given the information I have from the association plus video footage of you both, I managed to build these for you both. The gloves are for you Mina, and the bracelets are for you Gyro. I didn't have much information to go off of for your hands so using video footage and pictures I guess the dimensions needed. Please tell me if they are uncomfortable and I'll make the adjustments needed. The young hero stepped aside as Mina was first up to try on the gloves. Once attached it began to steadily morph over her entire hand. It was mostly made of a mixture of cotton materials and metals of various kinds to maximize comfort and durability. The gloves should offer you a greater range and much faster velocity in your attacks which when combined with your acidity should increase your penetrating power. Try to up your acidity to the limit and then drip it into the glove. Mina's eyes shined bright but was hesitant to do as instructed knowing how destructive her acid could be to machinery. But as she started with a small sample to test the material and found it didn't melt through brightening a smile to her face as she poured more in and a sound clicked out which Child Emperor said that was to signal it being full. The young hero then told her to shoot at the target 50 meters. Holding her hand out she followed the hero instructions on how to make the gloves fire. Soon after acid rocketed out of her palm in a steady stream reaching the target and burning and penetrating through it completely. The girl then started to whoop and holler at the inventions looking at the gloves dreamingly before turning to her friend. Who then took her equipment once she put on the bracelets they immediately gravitated towards her sound amplifiers, covering them and part of her upper arm and metal armor ending in a tube for her earphones jacks to plug into. Lo, she marveled at her new amplifiers. From what I could see from the test, your amplifiers lack a way for you to perform ranged attacks. Bracelets amp your traditional attacks while condensing the sound waves to a single blast allowing for range attacks. Gyro nodded her head and turned to the targets 50 meters away and shot a condensed sound wave. The blast went slower than she expected from seeing Mina's but it was still pretty quick reached the target in 3 seconds and knocking it completely down and also exploding outwards behind knocking the target down another 50 meters behind. Marveling at what happened she turned to look at Mina just in time for the pink girl to shoot another shot but her pose is what got to her the most. It looked almost exactly like. You see that Gyro, I can even do your crush's move now. Blushing somewhat, she stared at the girl. Crush? What do you mean crush? I don't have a crush on that idiot. Sure you don't, I still remember what happened at the start of the battle last time. You were really worried about him. We all were in the front lines away from all of us she defended. Oh, oh, oh but you were the first one to voice it in your silent words of encouragement. Ah, uh, that got Gyro to blush even more rapidly. Did she really say that out loud? Well, what about you and Kirishima, ha? Huh? He ran straight into hell almost literally to rescue you when you were in trouble and he constantly credits you for us succeeding, she said, trying to deflect. But it didn't seem to get the girl flustered at all. Me and Kirishima, you're kidding, he's always trying to be manly. He would have run in there to save anyone. She waved it off, as she never really thought about her classmate in that way. Besides, Yushi started but stopped her mouth hanging open causing Gyro to look confused at her friend. Earth to Mina, she waved her arm in front of the girl's face pinky what's up. The girl said nothing and only pointed at an object behind her. She followed the girl's hand and suddenly staggered back as well once she saw what the girl had seen. It was a robot. Not just anyone though this one was massive, towering over everything in that area being worked on by countless drones and atmontons. It looked straight out of an anime. Their gawking was interrupted by a resounding no from the young hero behind them. That is Brave Giant, a project that's still being built up. You are by no means going into that area. It is off limits. The child's voice was stern and not up for debate. Gyro knew it was more focused on Mina but even herself was curious to see inside of the thing. Fine, Mina said back while secretly taking a picture of the giant incomplete robot. Gyro nodded. What are we going to do now? Can we take these with us when we leave? Gyro asked. I want both of you to keep testing and trying them out and give me information on what you think can be improved. I don't want you leaving with them yet though these are still prototypes. I would like more data with you both before handing them over. While hearing a groan from Mina she nodded her head in understanding and turned back to face the targets. I bet I can hit more targets than you. Mina said. Loser, Baizo's the other a soda. Gyro replied. I was thinking, dinner. Mina escalated. You're on. Gyro accepted as they both began blasting away at targets. Inheritor of the tank top, tank top master, tank toppers, Shoji. 
So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 4. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author Lumpy Spark 3 on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.